Good evening and welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Today is Thursday, October 5th, 2017. May I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Dealey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Terry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Mrs. Starr? Here. Mr. Vashon? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. Um, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, do we have adjustments to the agenda? We do have several adjustments to the agenda tonight. Um, the first adjustment to the agenda is to add adjustments to the agenda um, as 5.0 been a busy week. Um, we also have to, uh, would like to adjust the agenda to move item 10.6 to follow item 4.0 as we have um, guest presenters this evening and uh, wanted to bring them to the board prior to going into the first um, executive session. We also have, um, so that makes exec the executive session now agenda item 5.0, an addition of 6.4 which is students helping students helping Hambrick, um, a brief update of a student project that we have going on, um, and then an addition of a student report to follow the chair's report at 7.0, an addition of a second executive session um, not to return to the public as agenda item 12.0, and then adjournment would become agenda item 13.0. Can we adjourn now? <laughs> So this presentation, 10.6, we want to go as part of the... We're going to actually have that follow the adjustments to the agenda oh, right prior up. to the motion to go in executive session. So there is um, a donation that the board will uh, be asked to accept, but we have some guests here to speak before that. Okay. Let's get right to it then. All right. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, two of our Scarborough residents. You guys can come right up to the podium who are part of the New England Realty Group. Um, so Tori and Matt are here to present with us tonight. Um, they're going to tell you a little bit about what they do, um, but we're really excited because they approached us um, as Matt is a Scarborough grad. What year did you graduate, Matt? Uh, 2008. 2008, he went away and explored the world and decided to come back here to Scarborough with That's his right. family. Um, and not only are they young entrepreneurs working hard to um, you know, launch their businesses, plural, um, they also have a child in kindergarten at Blue Point School and um, wanted to talk with me and Kate about ways that they could give back to the Scarborough Public School District. And so um, I won't steal their thunder because I know they have a few slides and I'm um, just really, am, I'm excited to bring back a Scarborough alum to the board so you can see kind of the product of the work that we do as a community here in Scarborough, um, but also very excited to serve them as a family and um, partner with them as we move our school district forward. Well, thank you for having us, guys. And um, yeah, so we, I know you guys have a full agenda, so we won't take a lot of your time. But um, yeah, we, you know, I, I moved away for a while, and I always said I would never move back north. But um, I said if I did, it would be back to Scarborough because um, I love the community. It's just a great feel, and uh, we're happy to be back here. So we have a, our offices in Pine Point. And uh, we live in the same area, and uh, Tori's daughter goes to Blue Point. So we wanted to do something to help with the community, and uh, I know that the school board funding issues have been, you know, kind of in the media lately. Um, so we figured that was a good place to step in. And uh, so we've made a donation, and what we've also pledged to do is donate a proceed, uh, the proceeds of each transaction through our agency. 5% uh, will go back to the school district. Okay. And then also any teachers or anybody associated with the school district that uh, buys or sells through us will also donate an extra 1% on top of that five. Oh, that's awesome. So. That's awesome. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Start off with who we are. Um, basically, we're just locals trying to keep within the community. Um, we live um, right in the area, like Matt said. Um, 
Matthew started the brokerage, New England Realty Group, um, and then kind of took me under his wing, and um, so we co-own that together. Um, and then basically we're just two young, motiva motivated people um, looking to get back. <laughs> awesome. And uh, also what brought us to, you know, donate to the school district out of, you know, all the different, the short list that we had, Tori actually used to be an educator herself. Yep. Um, so she's, she's familiar with the struggles that you guys all go through Absolutely. on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then also something that we wanted to touch on was uh, we've talked with Julie a little bit about, uh, you know, some outside of the box thinking as far as when it comes to the curriculum. And, uh, you know, something that we'd like to see a little bit more implement, implemented into the school district or the, um, is, you know, items like financial literacy, um, banking. I know that you guys do a lot with Sago and Biddeford, uh, so I, I don't know if maybe there's a way that they could team up and do something uh, as far as teaching kids more about how credit works, uh, credit cards, interest, stuff like that. It's stuff that we see on a daily basis. We also have a management company, so we do a lot of leasing. So we're constantly pulling people's credit, and it's always the same story. You know, I got all these student loans, I got credit cards when I was young, and I really didn't know how they were going to affect me for quite a few years down the road. So I think that, uh, you know, putting that, I don't know how it would work if it would be something built into the actual classroom or something extracurricular or something like that, um, but just educating kids on the importance of all of that, especially as they gear up for college and that they're looking into student loans and that sort yeah. of thing. I know for myself, student loans were um, free money until it wasn't free money anymore, <laughs> and I had to pay them back, and um, nobody had really talked to me about it. Um, and I didn't know a lot about what my payment was actually going to be. So all of a sudden I have a mortgage payment, essentially, um, and student loans, and no idea how I'm going to pay them. Um, and I think that um, students really just need to have that awareness going in that if you can get a job, if you can um, put some money away and anything that you can put towards your college education while you're there, it's going to help in the long run. Um, and just seeing <laughs> more education about that I think is definitely mm -hmm. uh, important. And then also a little bit more emphasis on like uh, mentoring programs and stuff along those lines to kind of help kids find their way before they get to college. I think a lot of people have a general idea of what they want to do. They know they want to go to school, but a lot of people don't really have nailed down specifically what they want to do or what industry they want to be in. Um, and I think that that's something that programs like this, you know, if more local businesses were giving back and creating these types of partnerships, um, I think that the kids could get involved too and might be able to kind of find their way and have somebody to guide them down that path. So, uh, I think that's, did you have anything else? No, just um, to piggyback on what Matthew was saying, um, just, you know, bringing presenters, we, we would like to partner with Scarborough School District to have some presentations about credit and banking and all of that important stuff um, and whether or not one or two presentations will impact, I, I don't know, um, mm -hmm. but if we can pull some more resources in, like Matthew said, some more companies within the area to present, um, I, I think that over time we could build something that definitely does have an impact on the on the students. Um, and then also we had talked to Julie about maybe down the road a chance of an internship or mentoring. Um, so students who maybe have no idea what they want to do um, and don't necessarily want to go to college um, could come and try out you know, some real estate we, or some ma property management, stuff like that. Um, Great. See what that's all about. Does anybody have any questions or? I just want to say thank you. I think that this is something that we've all been discussing about multiple times now of getting our students involved with life skills. Yes, yeah, it's very important. Be, being able to survive in the world, not right. just <laughs> by going to college. Yes. There are many, many opportunities for our so youngsters. Many. In going to college with a purpose. And they don't even know them. 
right. the opportunities in many instances that are available to them. Right. Absolutely. So I thank you very much for stepping up and I hope your child enjoys Blue Point as much as I do when I go to read stories. She mm -hmm. does. <laughs> Love it. One thing I would add, um, this dovetails really nicely into Matthew and Tori's vision dovetails very nicely with the community business partnership work that we've been doing um, and we're really gaining some momentum with that and we do have some other partners who are willing to come on board. As you know, we have um, a new internship program that we're currently developing and we have students who are looking for placements based on their interests and um, their passions that that course will actually begin in January so we're developing the mentor guide and all of that and getting input from our community business partner group um, on exactly how do we onboard new businesses so there will be lots of opportunities and for me um, when Matt when Matthew and Tori offered to donate a percentage of their commission back to the school district, um, this is something that we haven't quite done yet. And um, Kate and I are working on developing a memorandum of understanding so that we can be really clear about the boundaries of the, par the partnership. But also as we are continuing to work on our branding guidelines, it's an opportunity for them to be able to say, you know, we're proud supporters of the Scarborough Public Schools and use that in their marketing materials as well. Um, but I said to Matthew and Tori, I wouldn't just be saying yes to anyone who comes to us with a check in their hand and says we want to give back to the school system. It was really important that we had um, some shared values and shared commitments in terms of what education needs to look like today and in the future and I feel um, that we're very aligned in that way. Also, um, the fact that Matthew is a Scarborough alum was really important to us, and the fact that they live in the community, um, serve the community, and have a child in the schools. So again, having that criteria and through our initial conversation, it was really clear that we shared those values. And so that's what got us both to wanting to say, yes, this is going to be a positive partnership. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, Donna? and just to follow up on that school business partnership too, um, if you want to email the superintendent or me, I'm the liaison to that committee. Yes. So I can send you the dates mm -hmm. of the meetings. Yes. They're oh, held early in the morning, like 7.30. Oh, yeah, actually yeah. we do. Yeah, that you have that? Have, yeah, yeah. So yeah because that would there. be a great yeah. committee for you to, to mm -hmm. sit on. Yeah, and we're just in the beginning stages here, so, you know, for us it's not just about giving back financially. Whatever we can do beyond that, you know, mm -hmm. that we really want to get involved and, you know, try and make a difference. Mm -hmm. so great. That's great. Excellent. Well, thank you for your very thank generous you. Thank donation. You. Thank you. So in our initial conversation, they did um, uh, make an initial donation of $500, so I would ask the board to accept their generous donation. As well. Approval. Approval. Second. Any questions or comments in addition? No, just thank Great. you very thank much. Thank you. All in favor? Great. Yeah, I'm we'll go to lunch tomorrow. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Kate. <laughs> okay, so that takes us to, is it still 5.0, right? Yeah, kind of. Um, so we need a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 4056D for the purpose of discussing the Scarborough Educational Support Professionals contract to return to public session. So move. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. We'll be back.
going to share with you today. Okay, so we're back. Oh, back in public session. We'll right to uh, 6.0 superintendent's report. All right. All right. So the first is the enrollment report. And what I wanted to do was show folks how to access our enrollment data right on our website. Um, I'll continue to do the report, but I thought it's always, I'm always rattling off these numbers and it's kind of hard to make sense of them for me when I'm just hearing them. So I wanted to show you, if you go to our website, you'll see here where that red circle is. It says superintendent. So you want to click on superintendent and that brings you to my page. And then if you scroll down to the very, very bottom there, that's where you see the actual um, enrollment. And so I'm going <coughs> to take us, hopefully I don't start that. Um, I'm going to just take us there and show you how to access it. And then I'll update you on our enrollment because it has changed um, since last month. All right, so here we are coming to our page, scrolling over here to the side to where it says superintendent, and then down here at the bottom. This is actually um, a live Google Sheet, so as we update it, you'll have the most up-to-date information. Um, one of the exciting things I'll show you, too, down here at the bottom is that if you like to look at historical enrollment data, you have multiple years. And then on the very last tab, what I've done is created um, an end of year analysis compared to our long range projections. So here we have um, from our long range facilities plan, we partnered with planning decisions, which we'll talk a little bit about later, to come up with these enrollment projections going all the way out to 2025. And so what you'll see here is that when we ended the year last year, um, we were actually, although our enrollment's down from where it was a few years ago, um, we are outpacing the projections, both sets of projections, both the best fit model and the new housing model. Um, and so that's something that we're keeping an eye on as we navigate our long range planning. Um, and as I said, we'll talk about that a little bit later. <coughs> so looking at one of the other features we added to our enrollment report this year is, well, what did the data look like before school started and what does it look like now? So if you remember, we had um, right before the start of the school year, our kindergarten enrollment at Blue Point was a little bit higher than we expected. Um, our uh, amazing, brilliant assistant superintendent said, no worries, it's going to level out. Not all of those kids will be here for the whole year. She was right. Um, some of those students are not still enrolled, but I'll show you how the data has changed. So you'll see that August data um, in, the, in the column C there for the high school. And so we're about, we're one, we were down a few kids in September. We're back up again with um, seven new students added to the high school this year. And I was talking with um, someone from Guidance today, and we've had multiple students move out and multiple students move in. So there's actually been much more movement than what it just shows here. I think she said like 30 students have moved out, and then obviously um, more than that has moved in. So it's a very fluid process, enrollment, as we know. Um, at the middle school, Again, the same fluid, some in, some out, but we have 716 students at the middle school now. Um, and then when we look at Wentworth, sorry, this is not my normal device, so I better just use this little arrow here. Overall, it looks like our enrollment's down a little bit um, at Wentworth, but grade five has been stable. Some movement in grade four and grade three. Blue Point, we have 175 students. So there you can see how the kindergarten enrollment has adjusted since August when we started school um, to where we are today. And because those schools are so small, those K-2 schools, we only have three, two or three or four sections of each grade level depending on the size of the grade level. One or two kids really can make a class feel really big or make the numbers feel like the class sizes are really nice and small. Um, so that's something that we're always monitoring. Um, eight Corners is still our um, most highly populated K-2 school. We have 224 students 
at Eight Corners, and Pleasant Hill has 170 students, so their enrollment has gone up a little. Overall, as a district, we have um, 10 more students this month than we had last month, um, but again, there could be a lot of new, uh, the number of new students could be much higher because we would have had some students who maybe moved out. Um, and then from the start of the school year, we have four more students since then. So that's how enrollment's looking uh, so far this year. <clears throat> and then for the next 6.2, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit. We had the um, opportunity to have a presentation from the NERG group, Matt and Tori, who talked to us about that new partnership that we're developing. And we're calling these types of funding sources our creative funding sources because they're above and beyond how public schools are traditionally funded through um, local, state, and federal dollars. Um, and we're really working hard to nurture and establish these partnerships um, here in Scarborough. So this is another group that came to us and said, hey, we have this idea. You remember they came, um, uh, SACOBID came and presented to the school board prior to us entering into this agreement. Um, and so the cards are out. And we have multiple, um, I think there's 15 Scarborough cards floating around the district um, currently. And there's a few other communities who are also um, participating in this program. Remember, every transaction um, will yield a return to the school district that goes directly to offset the cost of our food service program, our food and nutrition program, and that's part of their, um, their uh, purpose with this is to help offset that food insecurity challenge that we have here in Maine. And we all are very passionate about that. We have several board members who work actively with Project Grace, and we have the food pantry at Wentworth and work with the backpack program and all that to also help combat that. So again, looking for partners who share our values, not just willing to partner with anybody who says like, um, hey, you know, we want to be a partner, being really strategic about who we say yes to, as that I feel that defines our brand and our identity as a school system. So I was curious to know how the other schools that are participating in the program are doing. And so the data that you see down here is just really my notes, but the other communities that are participating are Biddeford. So we have 15 debit cards out there in the universe right now. They have 23. SACO has 40 debit cards out. Old Orchard Beach has 22. Um, and Westbrook has 10. So we really want to get the word out and remind folks High school students, if you're looking to get your first debit card, you could get a Red Storm debit card and give back to your schools the way that Matt and Tori are feeling so um, committed to giving back. And I wanted to show you the website also, so it's linked here in the presentation. Um, anyone who banks with them can get a Scarborough card, and it does say Scarborough High School on it, but remember it's going to our, our overall nutrition program. Um, it's just that at this time that logo is specific to the high school. So here's where it talks about um, the program and it, more, and it shows that it really benefits all of our schools um, and there's information for folks to be able to sign up and get their card if you already bank there. Th there's no cost regardless if you're new to banking with SACOBID or if you um, already bank with them and you want to trade it in for a new Red Storm card. So that's a really exciting thing that's happening with our creative funding. Do we, do, we, do we know yet what um, what our what the contribution will be per swipe yet, or is that still being worked out? I think they're kind of seeing how a few months go before they commit to the amount. So in our agreement, um, initially they had talked about it being five cents per transaction. Mm -hmm. So we're lo hoping to get more information once they kind of monitor what the potential impact would be. Um, but there's zero cost to the district, so it's a win-win all around, if, no matter what it ends up being, right? Um, Julie, do you know if there's any opportunity to change that so it doesn't just say the high school, so that people wouldn't, I, I don't know, if people might misunderstand that it would only <coughs> be going to the nutrition at high school, or? Yeah, we, um, Kelly and I have been in contact with them to talk about that. That was really <coughs> an oversight on my part. They did send the prototype ahead of time, and I was all excited about it. I didn't mm -hmm. notice it just said high school until after we, Got, um, somebody sent me a picture of one and, of course, covered up their number. And I was like, 
why does it say the high school? And I looked back and I'm like, oh, yeah, we agreed to that. <laughs> mm. So um, I'm going to talk with them and see yeah. if there's any way to change it. I know they have all the other cards on their website, too, so I'm wondering if there's also, say, high school. I didn't no, know. There th no, they don't. They don't. Each one's different. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, any other questions about the SACO bid cards? Are we free to publicize this? Yes, it's public information. Um, that's why I included the link to the website so we can start posting that and saying, you know, do you bank at Saco Bid? Do you want to get your card today? Um, I wish that we knew f for sure exactly what that return was going to be, but um, I think either way, it's again. I think we'll know like in the next month or two. Do you? I'll follow up and find out specifically on the timeline for that. Okay. That's a good question. All right, so the next thing that I was going to do is really just introduce the chiefs with the public safety presentation. I don't know if we want to continue through the agenda. agenda and continue, and, and then when they get here, we'll just Perfect. circle back. Sounds good. They're on their way. We also have the yeah. students. Oh, I can skip over that. T-shirts, and so what? Um, the middle school principal reached out to the Wentworth principal and talked about rallying around this, um, rallying around this project and this opportunity. And so we have some numbers from Wentworth. They've collected so far 232 pairs of socks, 261 T-shirts, 124 backpacks. $1,035.30 so far, and I have a little video that we're going to share with you. This fourth grade student that you see here, Kate Goodwin, um, we're highlighting her specifically because on her own, um, she's featured in the video for one, but she raised $108 on her own from a bake sale that she had. Um, and so the middle school, we don't have their numbers yet because they're still working um, on their goals, and they have a bike-a-thon scheduled for Monday, October 9th. Um, that is a holiday, but many staff and students are going to be participating in the bike-a-thon, and half of the money that they raise will be donated um, back to the school in Hambrick. And so I will let the video give you the rest of the intro. Um, to the work that they're doing. It's pretty fantastic. Maine students are making a difference for middle schoolers in Houston after Hurricane Harvey. Scarborough's Wentworth School and the middle school are collecting cash and basic necessities right now to help students down south affected by the storm. Johnny Morse, an assistant principal in Houston and a Scarborough grad, reached out to Scarborough middle school principal Diane Neto after seeing how many of his students were feeling Harvey's impact. Morse says about a fifth of his 1,000 students are affected so Neto set up a school project, and students are stepping up to help. Because they need to buy a lot of more things, and I think it will help. It was just great because it was a real concrete example for our kids to say this school, these students, um, are ones that others could benefit from. Several businesses are stepping up to donate items as well, including paying for the cost of shipping. The schools will also be donating half of the proceeds from a benefit walk and ride set for this Monday, Columbus Day. 
Now we can go anywhere. We learn. So I just wanted to also, you know, share this with you in celebration. We'll have more totals for you at our next business meeting um, and probably photos, I'm sure, of the bike and walkathon that's happening on Monday. So now that our special, any questions about that, about the Hamburg fundraiser thing that's happening? Yeah, I'm plugged up. There we go. How can people contribute? So that's a great question. If you know a middle school student who's doing yeah. the bike a I, I I know there's a couple that we might know. Um, Cormac know Murphy will be participating, I'm sure. He's walking now. Okay. He's trial run with the bike. 20 is really far. So 20 miles. So I think mm -hmm. he's going to walk, I think. But mm -hmm. also we'll take your money for walk. <laughs> Um, you could also reach out to the middle school principal uh, um, or the Wentworth principal to find out how you could give if, if that was something that you're interested in. They're also just taking cash donations yes. up outside of the, because it's the, um, the AIDS bike and walkathon, so they're splitting the funds this year for Houston. Yep. So if you want to give it the money so it goes directly to Houston 100%, then you could just bring it right to the school. Yep. Thank you. I think it's important. There may be a number of citizens, staff, who who may wish to participate. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's a great cause. Um, and they're collecting the cash because they w we were collecting very specific things like the shirts and the backpacks and the socks and the necessities. Um, but some necessities that you need as a middle schooler, we didn't want middle schoolers bringing to school, so that's why we decided to yeah. collect cash. Can you use your imagination for that. All right, so going back, um, I do have a little presentation just to introduce our guest tonight. Chief Thurlow and Chief Moulton are here to talk to us about the public safety building project that's happening. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the community was aware of how the schools and how our young people are benefiting from their good work. Not only do they serve the adults in the community, but they really help us make sure that our schools are safe um, and that we are supportive of our students both um, in a preventative ways, also in times of crisis and need as well. So I'm going to share with you a little timeline of our, I know some questions have come up you know, um, about the project um, that the public safety project that will be on the ballot in November and, and they're wondering well what's going on with the schools because we know there's needs in the schools as well so we'll talk a little bit about our timeline for that and then I'll just share um, some brief bullet points about our current partnership and then some ideas that we've been talking about for future partnership um, to enhance the partnership that we already have so here's the timeline. I fast forward a little bit to 2016 when I joined the district, um, but I know that this long range facility planning work has been going back all the way to 2013. Um, Joanne Sizemore and I were talking today a little bit about the work that has been done and that led up to this final draft, the long range draft plan that was published. It's that big thick book that you all have back in January of 2016. Um, and then as I came on board, uh, we kind of revisited the situation, looked at, I, there was conversation in the past of could we close one of our K-2s, did we still need all three of our K-2s. Our current enrollment and student needs are saying that we absolutely need all three K-2s and in fact, um, you know, we'll be maximizing that space in the very near future with some things coming down the pike from the Department of Ed in Augusta um, in terms of supporting our youngest students, our preschool age students. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So in January, after we did all of that updating in my first few months of being here with the Long Range Planning Committee, this Long Range School Board Planning Committee and many of our district leaders, uh, we had a presentation here in Chambers A by Harriman and they talked to us about all those different options, A through F, um, and we analyzed them as the school board um, and we asked Harriman to go back and generate what would it cost if we were just to take our existing facilities and bring them up to speed. And so that would be right sizing the middle school. That would also be eliminating the modular units from our three K2s that we have and also trying to um, generate some efficiencies in terms of the way that those smaller K2s are utilizing our resources like um, energy and um, fuel. So 
they've been working on that. Um, while they went back and worked on that, they also were, we also asked them to price what would it look like if we were to consolidate the middle school, um, or right size the middle school rather, and consolidate our K-2s so that we could find some efficiencies in that. And so that's a really labor intensive project that they've been working on looking at like what's the do nothing cost over time and we're looking from you know now all the way out to 2025 and then what would be the cost savings or cost benefit or return on investment if we were to implement a consolidated K2, right size to middle school, those types of things. Um, but in the meantime, we also have um, applied for the Department of Education's rating cycle um, application process this year. So this is for us, we're trying to access um, state funds to update our facilities. And it's a very labor intensive <laughs> process um, that our Director of Facilities and Maintenance, Todd Jepson, led and coordinated with input from all of the building principals, many central off folks, lots of support from Kate Bolton, our business um, our Director of Business and Finance, and partnering with Harriman. And so it's not just as simple as, okay, we'll fill out the application. Each one of those applications ends up being a case study of the facility. And we applied for four schools. So you have to repeat that process for each school. And in that process, you're not coming up with solutions. You're not sharing your ideas of what you think um, would be the best next step. You're just identifying inefficiencies, um, program challenges, safety issues, um, all of that, um, if there's any places where we're not compliant in terms of um, American Disabilities Act, we're looking at all of those things. If there's asbestos or other unsafe materials in the school, all of that's part of this process. So you just get to tell them what are all the problems that you have in your schools. And we did that for K um, Blue Point, Eight Corners, Pleasant Hill separately, each separate applications, and the middle school. And so now we're in a bit of a waiting game. We knew that we would apply in April and that visits would be scheduled this year. Our visits are coming up. There will be two schools visited on November 9th and um, Todd Jepson, myself, Joanne, um, and the principals will walk around <laughs> with the Department of Education and assess the facilities. Um, so we hope to get two schools in in one day and then they'll come back again on the 17th. So um, we do have a board meeting on November 16th and our plan for that is to be able to give you some of those um, long range return on investment um, analysis that we've been working on with Harriman. In the meantime, um, since you last selected the option to right size the middle school and consolidate the K2, and request for those numbers along with what would it take to um, just improve what we have without doing those things. Um, we've learned that preschool's coming pretty quickly. Um, we don't know for sure what the exact timeline will be, but the, the Department of Education is talking about school systems taking on the responsibility of providing child development services for students ages three, four, and five. And, um, so we've been thinking a lot about how could we use our existing space to meet that mandate if and when it comes, um, and then what would be you know, some potential improvements that may need to occur as, we, as preschool grows. The research is really compelling, and I think everyone is, is finally listening to um, what a smart investment early intervention is in the long run. We know that it costs far less to support a child when they're two, three, four, five, than it does to wait until they're older, um, say, third grade, and realize that there's learning gaps or, um, you know, um, developmental delays that could have been addressed earlier. So early intervention is the movement. Um, Maine is not, um, Maine is right on track with thinking about that. It's just the timeline that the department is proposing is a, a little bit unrealistic, it feels like, at this time, because what they're, what the, um, rec the proposed timeline that I had heard was that this would be a year of planning and then um, in 1819 there would be five of the nine regions that would be required to take on those services and it could look a lot of different ways. I mean we can get really creative about how those services are delivered. Um, and then in 1920 the remaining four regions would, would then um, be responsible for providing that, that service. 
So we're listening closely, we're attending meetings, we're following um, the updates that are coming to us slowly at this time with the department, but I just received a notification today that there's going to be some committee meetings that are happening weekly starting um, in, in the next couple of weeks. So we'll be watching that closely, but in terms of our facilities, we're starting to think about what space do we have in our existing facilities and what could be a smart way to kind of get ahead of that mandate and begin to do some planning. And that will be a, a big conversation in this budget cycle. After the department comes in November for those site visits, it'll be quiet for a while because they're going to be visiting all of the districts that applied. And um, multiple districts applied. There were 81 schools on the list. And I, I say this openly because that's public information. I believe you could access that list. Scarborough is at the bottom of the list currently, but that's only because they're in alphabetical order. We're still hopeful that we will um, end up higher on the list, but um, we know that the amount of funding that's available certainly isn't going to be able to support all 81 projects. But remember that just because there's 81 schools, it doesn't mean that there will be 81 projects. For example, if we were fortunate enough to make the top of the list and become a priority and the solution became to consolidate our K-2, that would move everybody up three schools on the list, right? Also, Portland has six schools on the list and they have four of those schools are on their November ballot. So if you know anyone in Portland, tell them to vote yes. <laughs> and that would move everybody up on the list. Um, by those schools. So um, given what I'm hearing around the state that especially in northern Maine, a lot of the issues aren't about expansion. Um, some schools like our neighbors in Gorham are looking to expand their facilities because their enrollment is growing, but some are looking to consolidate to find efficiencies in that way. So we will wait to see um, where we are in June and then really That'll kind of launch our long-range planning again. We'll revive all the good plans that we have. We'll rethink what's happening um, in the state and also f what's happening you know, nationally around education as we get back into the planning process. So it's a lot of work um, just to get the numbers and say, well, what if and what if and what if and what if, but that's really where we are. Um, I think the important thing to remember is that the long-range future will, de will depend on these three <coughs> factors, um, what, what the DOE project list looks like um, and how that moves over time because even what they publish at day one will change as projects um, are taken on and, um, you know, hopefully the list moves quickly. Also, our enrollment and our program needs are going to drive our long-range facilities and then community priorities. I think we can't underestimate how important it is to look at Scarborough as one community and understand, um, you know, what's, what's the most urgent matter and how do we all come together and rally in support of that most urgent matter so that we can continue to grow and thrive as a community in, in one piece as one whole. And so that's why I'm really excited to invite the Chiefs tonight and share our time um, on the big screen with them so they can talk a bit about their project. Um, but uh, here's just some of the ways that we partner with the Scarborough Police Department. We have a school resource officer at the high school, Officer Plord, who um, works closely with administration and students. Uh, we also have an SRO at the middle school who does the same. Um, and not only during the school day, after school hours, on the weekends, um, if our teachers are there working late and they need support, the police department is always um, very responsive to our calls. We've had some um, kind of mischievous behavior happening at some of our schools after school hours um, and teachers have been there working and you know not feeling safe when those things are happening uh, and calling the police department they come right over. We also have a liaison officer who's assigned to engage with K-5 um, and that's Officer Greenleaf and he um, has helped with things like you know pick up and drop, drop off traffic patterns, just analyzing that with the principal at Wentworth and saying how can we make this safer and more efficient for everyone um, and spent lots of time there last year specifically helping with that and other things. We um, continue to have the D.A.R.E. program at fifth grade, so all of our students go through the D.A.R.E. program. Um, Chief Moulton uh, is a member of our health and safety advisory team, which is a um, school town partnered um, health and safety team that we look at various issues 
that affect our community and how um, the schools and our public safety providers work together to ensure safety. Training and exercising of emergency plans. Also, um, something that we're establishing this year is this K-12 Comprehensive Substance Use Prevention Team. Um, so it's a small team getting started. Chief Moulton's a member of that, but we're really looking at all of the work that we're doing from kindergarten all the way up in the name of prevention. So how do we name um, how do we put a name to some of those things, such as social emotional learning, self-regulation, mindfulness, growth mindset, um, the pathways curriculum that we utilize at Wentworth, the counseling that occurs throughout the grades, advisory crew, all these things are really supporting the whole child, and we believe um, that that is how you how you get at prevention, is helping students learn how to self-regulate and, and manage and reach out for support and when they do. Uh, something I'm really passionate about, as you could tell, but more to come about that. Um, <laughs> also, interaction through Project Grace with the schools and the nurses and the nutrition staff, consulting on an as-needed basis, um, just with public safety issues involving the schools in general, and connecting our students and our athletes to the Day One program, and helping us just think about could, who could we bring in in terms of like really powerful speakers that can have a positive impact on our students. So. The list is longer than that, but there's a few things that we pulled together. Um, and similarly with our fire department, we have a fire explorer program for high school age children. We also, um, the fire department also does public fire education and demonstrations in the school, October is Fire Safety and Prevention Month, so we'll be engaging in that work. Um, active members along with the SROs in the Juvenile Fire Safety Collaborative, working with youth fire setters participation in um, town-wide um, committees, that's the, I should have edited that out, but that's the H, the S, the H-S-S-I-T, we have, you know, more acronyms than, I should have edited that, <laughs> that's my fault, I just did a copy and paste here. You guys know I like to always put a little typo in there, just so you make sure you're paying attention, um, I'll make that big again because the list is long. <laughs> Like it never happened, look at that. Um, the emergency management, planning, training, and exercising is really important. Um, even when there's disasters in town, or, or not necessarily disasters in town, but like challenging weather coming. Or I know that my first call that I had where we were going over all the safety plans, I was, my eyes were wide open at how involved our public safety partners are and how thorough the plans are. And it was like a Sunday morning, I think we were all on the call. I was at Sugarloaf in like a little bottom of the mountain with like 50 kids banging their ski boots <laughs> trying to follow the directions. But um, that it's amazing to just see everybody come together. And so then also um, the job fairs and job shattering opportunities as we look at the, the new graduation requirements, you know, really getting our kids involved in, is um, an exciting opportunity. And so in the future, having them right here on campus those opportunities, I imagine, are only going to improve and grow with easier access. Getting students to be able to come to the public safety building right now is not easy, even though they're right there. You know, as we all know, crossing Route 1 is not a safe um, option for our students. But moving forward, I think to continue the collaboration on relevant safety and prevention programming for both the staff and the students, um, and like I said, the proximity of them being on campus is going to be a huge benefit for us. And also, um, we're talking a lot about how can we create these wellness presentations um, in the name of prevention, but also support workshops that we could um, possibly deliver not only to students and staff, but to our community as a whole, book clubs, activities. Um, we're looking at uh, train, the train, the, train the Trainer program for our nurses so that um, they can learn, they've already been trained on administering Narcan and we would like to be able to think about what would that look like if we expanded access to that in our schools and who else would need to be trained um, in, the, in the midst of this opioid crisis. And then also the possibility um, of that large training room that they're going to have. It'll hold up to 100 people and we are always struggling to find space to do large trainings. Mm -hmm. This space works well for us and we can have both chambers A and B but as you see, that's not going to be an option for the next month or so just with voting happening. So that, that is a huge asset to the whole community. 
So um, we're excited about that. They're going to give us a brief presentation so we can really understand the project, and then we have drafted a resolution that um, Kelly will share with the board as, after their presentation. So I'm just going to transition to your slides, guys. If you want to come on up, um, Kelly's going to come over and help me. Here, Kelly. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate the opportunity and the nice introduction. Um, the folks often talk about how important education is, and especially at budget time, you often hear about the most important thing the town does is educate its youth, which we both firmly believe in. Robbie and I are native, proud graduates of Scarborough High School and have a lot in our careers to be proud of and that get it started here. But one of the other things that the that communities do is protect its citizens and, and that's another thing that I think sometimes gets lost or is taken as second nature and, and folks assume and uh, I think this project is really, it's been an opportunity to, to have that conversation with folks so we really appreciate your time. This presentation is what we've been giving out in the community. We've, we've held a number of neighborhood uh, meetings and, and uh, we're going to every civic group in town and, and certainly appreciate your time here and uh, we'll try to, to go through it fairly quickly because I know you've got a big agenda tonight. <clears throat> the ad hoc committee uh, we set up back in, in almost a year ago now and it's 13 folks and, and we're very pleased because we've got a number of folks that have a lot of experience in construction. Uh, Kevin Freeman, who's the chair of our ad hoc committee, is a construction manager in the business. Bruce Bell, one of our 60-year veterans, uh, built Hadlock Field in, in Portland and worked for Public Works in Portland for a number of years. Dave Libby, CEO from Town and Country Credit Union. Uh, we've got a retired police chief, Rocky Visbera. So j just a ton of folks with a lot of experience. Rick Meinking from Energy Efficiency uh, to help us with some of the sustainability stuff. So it's been a pleasure working with these folks. Uh, on this collaborative effort. What we're going to talk about tonight are, are just some highlights of the needs for the new facility. We're going to talk about the space needs assessment that we went through and how we decided on the site uh, that we're going to build on, the site selection process. Uh, we've got some plans and, and some perspective views to show you. And then we'll spend a couple minutes on the financial piece, which is, you know, this, this program is designed to answer the questions that we most frequently are asked. So when we talk about need, there's four or five <coughs> things. Access and egress is really the, the first thing that we talk about. As anybody who's traveled through town knows, because of our proximity to Oak Hill <laughs> intersection, even with our lights on and our sirens, when folks would like to yield the way, they physically can't. It's gridlock, as you can see in this picture, with four lanes and sometimes five lanes trying to get out of the, the ramp at Oak Hill or for the police department to use one of the two side streets that they need to add. I think what really uh, <coughs> sells this project is when we can get people through the door and let them walk around in the, in the uh, public safety building and see some of the issues that we're dealing with. <coughs> and some of these are a little bit difficult to see, but on the top left-hand corner you'll see in the fire department they have a room there that is built uh, of file cabinets with some wall board uh, put on top of it in order to create a, uh, an office space there for an inspector to work. The uh, next picture over you see on top is uh, the, some of the uh, firefighters are, spend 24 hours at the station uh, on their shift and this is the, the uh, little bit of uh, space that they have to spend that 24 hours in. It's not, as you can see, it's not, uh, not much. The middle top is uh, in our radio and telephone room where uh, technicians have to squeeze between those racks and the wall to try to tune uh, radio equipment and, and swap out a, uh, equipment as needed. A very difficult situation. The next one uh, on the top is what started its life as our lunchroom. 
and now uh, because of some because of some changes that we've made in the in the uh, station on the police side uh, we no longer have a booking area or, or jail cells we take people directly to the county jail um, and so we had no place to put an intoxilizer and and some file cabinets and things like that so the problem is at any given time you can have somebody trying to have lunch somebody else processing uh, somebody for OUI somebody else looking for files uh, and somebody else may be doing some training so it's it's uh, not a very good situation. The top right is, uh, is my famous gutter. I have a gutter inside of my office. Uh, we built the building in 1989, and since that time, they've never been able to stop the water from flowing in that corner of the office, and uh, things would get ruined in that corner, and they've tried everything from roofing to glaze to windows and never been able to solve it. So I finally went down to the hardware store, got some gutter, put it in, and I have two uh, recycled uh, Baskets underneath there, and when it's raining hard, dispatch will come up in the middle of the night and take the elbow off and switch buckets and put it uh, put it back. One recent storm, I left at five o'clock. It wasn't uh, in the afternoon. It wasn't raining. When I returned at eight o'clock in the morning, we had a bucket full, which I had the evidence tech uh, weigh, and it was 56 um, pounds. So I think water is seven pounds a gallon or eight pounds a gallon. So there's seven or eight gallons of water overnight that are coming into my office. Uh, on the bottom left, you see uh, that's the only conference space that the fire department folks have. Uh, to, to we, they have oftentimes they have people that are planning developments and buildings and multi-million dollar projects, and they're coming in. The only space they have to lay that out is that table, which is back to the uh, file cabinet wall, with two bathrooms on the end, and the deputy chief's office, which is our old holding cell when when the police station was over in that. Uh, part of the building with no ventilation, no windows, no anything. It's not a very impressive site for somebody who's coming in and wants to spend some, some money to come to Scarborough or put a project in Scarborough when that's what they, uh, that's where they lay it out. The next uh, one on the bottom is the, the inside of that uh, office that's built with file cabinets and that is the only place that uh, the fire inspector has to store all the plans from those projects and things after they've been reviewed it is just stuffed underneath that desk. The next one on the bottom going right is uh, what, uh, was, what was a mechanical space when the building was built. Over time, we've had to move it to be our network center because we used to have all the computers in dispatch, but the noise and the heat and so forth, as we grew, we had to move those out, and so they ended up going up in that mechanical space. And then uh, when we had some special enforcement folks who had absolutely no place to go, um, we ended up dragging them up there, and, and so they work out of that space. Again, no windows, no ventilation, no uh, uh, the noise of all the network equipment and so forth. Not a great situation. And the far right is uh, where we bring people in who are getting bonded and so forth, who need their fingerprints taken. It used to be teachers getting their fingerprints taken. Um, and the only place we have to do that is under the stairwell, uh, where the uh, and we also have a refrigerator out there for water samples for Department of Marine Resources and it, it has to come in and pick up uh, water samples from our clam flats and things. And I, I try to keep Mike out of there because there's so many code violations that he'd uh, <coughs> be in serious trouble if he gets looking around too much. We also put some statistics together for the folks that really like to look at the numbers. And, and this chat, I know it's a little bit busy, but what we tried to do was we started in 1968 and, and 1972. 68 was the year that the police department actually moved from the old town hall to the old fire station. And then four years later in 72 is when we first brought new full-time dispatches on and, and had a full combined public safety dispatch center. So you can see back in those years, the town's population was less than 8,000. We had less than 300 businesses in town, calls for service for the police department, we're in the 1,500 to 2,500 range. The fire department was doing a little over 600 calls a year. Then fast forward 17 years to 1989, which was the year that we added the modern police station onto the back of that facility. <clears throat> in 1989, now the uh, fire department is up to 34 full-time personnel. Uh, the police, I'm sorry, the police department is up to 34. The fire department now has six full-time personnel. Our population is well over 12,000. We've uh, almost doubled the uh, number of businesses. Police calls for service are up five times, uh, over 10,000. 
wow. and the fire department's doing 1,500 calls for service. Move forward 27 years to, to 2016, which is the last full fiscal year where we were able to grab stats to, to compare. The police department now is uh, 60 members strong between civilian and sworn officers. The fire department has 31 full-time staff. Uh, the town's population was just under 20,000. Uh, the number of businesses, well over 1,300. Uh, and you can see the calls of service continued to increase dramatically. And then to come up with the projections for 25 years out in 2041, we looked backwards 15 years to those uh, response statistics and, and use some science to generate some, some real projections going forward. And, and you can see, we're certainly going to be a much busier town going forward. So one of the other things that we're looking at are the things that have changed since 1989. And this is just a small list of some of the things that we were not dealing with when this building, when, when our current facility was built. Um, the fire department didn't have a student live-in program, no hazardous materials response to speak of. Uh, community paramedic services didn't, uh, wasn't there. No technical rescue, safety and compliance officer, EMS billing, records clerk. We weren't doing Operation Hope. Human trafficking uh, was not an issue for us. We weren't doing polygraphs. Uh, we didn't even know what cybercrime was. Uh, there were no video forensics. We didn't have community resource officers, canine officers, school resource officers. We weren't processing all of our own evidence. We certainly weren't dealing with the mental health issues that we deal with today. And identity theft was, was not an issue. Now, we've looked at, uh, at these things and we recognize that you know, even though we're dealing with this now, when, and when we build a new building, we understand that 25 years from now, there'll be a whole uh, list of things like this that we're not thinking of now or have no idea or even on the horizon, but um, we have to try to at least plan to, to absorb some of those. So that kind of summarizes the need for the facility, and, and as the Chief mentioned earlier, anybody that's been through the facility clearly that's the least of our worries. We, it sells itself. And for anybody that hasn't had an opportunity, if you go on to the town's website, um, scabbermain.org slash PSB for public safety building, there is a video tour on there that the chief and I narrated so folks can actually sit in their living room and in 10 minutes take a tour and see some of the challenges that we face. So the next thing we wanted to chat about briefly was the space needs and site selection process. Um, as we develop this and work through the committee process, the first thing you have to do is figure out how much space you need. And that really took a, a great deal of time and effort. We started with a 2008 study. This project has been in the works for over 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And the town actually invested in, in a feasibility study back in, we started in 2007, the report came out in 2008 with a local architect. We even went to the point of buying land next to the veterans home on Commerce Drive uh, and did a land swap with the veterans home at that time. Um, the plan of, of the space needs assessment went through six different revisions to boil it down mm -hmm. from wants to needs and, and uh, it was a very thorough process. And beyond that, once we decided what we needed for space, then we knew what we needed for a lot to accommodate that space. And the site selection process started by identifying all the four acre parcels, which is the minimum size it would take to accommodate the size building that we need, within the central fire district here at Oak Hill. Uh, we're governed by NFPA standards and, and insurance services standards as to response time and distance between our stations. So there's a relatively narrow window of where the station could be in this central Oak Hill area. We came up with a number of different sites. We narrowed those down to 12 sites that we formally put through a very detailed matrix scoring process that included 16 different variables from things like, you know, highway access, um, wetland issues, cost of acquisition. There's a number of different uh, variables. And the uh, site next to Town Hall, um, right over here on Route 1, clearly rose to the top of that process. There's a number of reasons why, uh, you know, that this came out this way on the matrix, but we are both also very pleased uh, to have uh, an opportunity possibly to 
to be here on this campus because I just see uh, we see a lot of advantages to it. We see one-stop shopping for for consumers who want to come in and uh, find out that they need to come to the police station and pay their parking ticket or they need to come to uh, over to the planning office to talk about a project or something. Um, but also for, for your perspective, I think one of the things that I really uh, think is important is the, the uh, public meeting space that we're going to have there. And I see that as being a real advantage too if we should have a situation in the schools where we have to do an evacuation or something, I see that just as being a natural reunification place. Um, we can bring parents in there, we can bring students in there, everybody's safe. Um, our, our response time certainly is, uh, is uh, minimal when we're right here on campus. And so for those reasons, I just think it's, uh, I just think it's a great place for us to be and I think it, uh, it just makes a lot of sense. So this is a site plan, uh, I've got a close up, but this kind of gives you a view of that whole corner of the complex. So down along the bottom edge, that's Route 1. The street to the left is Sawyer Road, and you can see Memorial Park and Durant Drive at the top of the slide. All of the dark is the new uh, interconnecting road uh, that starts over by the four-way intersection by the lower <coughs> parking lot at the high school and comes across uh, to it crosses that small section of wetlands out behind the car wash and Sudsies and then comes out to the intersection where the driveway to 301 Route 1 is of the Nordex uh, main health building. Um, town Hall is, is to the right and the uh, building is shown there in pink. And I think this next slide just gives a little bit of a, a blown up version. Um, part of the, the rationale for this site plan, the, the site plan is costing a little bit more than it would in a, a different location because of the length of that road, but we really feel that that's adding a lot of value to the, the whole municipal complex. It gives us some interconnectivity, there's a number of parking spaces that we've tried to build in along that road so that we can share those with folks that use the park, uh, and we're trying to, while well, minimizing the amount of paving and impervious surface and being cognizant of that, also provide some shared parking between all of the facilities that we can use. If you could go back one slide, Mike. I, I'd just like to point out that if you see where the dark is in the upper right-hand uh, quadrant as well, um, that's one of the other advantages that we see to this design. And like the chief said, um, this, this, the whole project costs a little more because of how we have to develop this roadway and so forth. But we also think that building that as a T intersection up on the top there and eliminating the back entrance to uh, town hall and so forth is going to make a, a whole lot less congestion mm -hmm. uh, for school traffic and so forth when, when uh, the buses and the, and the traffic is coming in and out of the schools and so forth. Um, we think that that's going to be a much safer access point and, and shut off where some of that congestion is. So these, I, I know that there is enough detail here, but uh, the point that we we wanted to make with these schematic designs, these are kind of the floor plans. The building is actually, it's a three-story building, but there's four levels to it because the apparatus bays are so high because of the height of our trucks that we're able to get a mezzanine area in there which helped us to shrink the size of the building and um, be cost effective with our design. But the real key to these drawings is the color coding. So as you look at this in the next slide, the pink is the fire department area. So the one on the left, this is the basement level of the apparatus bay area. Uh, all of that pink is fire department apparatus bays and some of the ancillary rooms that go with it. The blue area are police spaces. So in the, uh, the right hand side, uh, those are locker rooms. On the left, that's all the evidence processing and storage area. And then the purple is shared space. And, and one of the ideas behind keeping this a public safety building is the fact that we are together. That provides a lot of different things. It's cost effective for construction. It's cost effective in overall maintenance and, and all the things, just like the conversation you're having with K2 schools, it allows us to do the same thing instead of heating and maintaining two different facilities. Plus the fact that we work hand in hand on every call, we're at each other's calls, it just operationally makes so much sense. So all of the purple areas are shared spaces. The one on the left is uh, a shared fitness and, and workout area. On the right, that's our mezzanine area. 
The shared purple space there is our network operations center where all the IT and E911 lines, uh, all our radio infrastructure comes in. It's right under dispatch, so it's a real efficient design. The red space on the mezzanine is fire department space. The blue, obviously, police. And then there's some gray there, which are our combined um, maintenance and mechanical type spaces, so the boiler room mm -hmm. and, and elevator machine and those types of things. The main floor or the first floor of the facility is on the left here. And once again, color coded similarly. The red is the dormitory space, the kitchen, the day room for the fire department. The pink in this one, or the purple, is the dispatch center, a combined public safety dispatch center. All of the green is public space here. So the main entrance is, is uh, on the right-hand side of that left-hand design. Uh, and you can see the 100-person uh, classroom. It's the emergency operations center for us. It's a classroom that we have a divider in that we can both run concurrent training sessions or meetings, or we can open it up to one large event, uh, and it'll also be available for the public when we're not using it for public safety purposes. And then on the left is the blue police patrol area on the main floor. That's where all the, uh, the normal patrol officers work, they, where they do their briefings, where they write their reports. Um, and all those types of activities. And then finally on the right, that's the second story. That's the admin wing, if you will. Uh, the blue on the left is the uh, detective bureau. On the right, uh, in the front, the, the red is the fire department admin. Once again, you see a bunch of purple there. That's the shared uh, conference area, shared secretarial pools. So if my secretary is out, Rob's can, can uh, take care of it. We, we've tried to continue to build all those efficiencies into our design. And we also think that, uh, you know, not just uh, those human resources, but also the, uh, the fact that we're dealing with one fax machine and one copy machine and all of those kind of one work area and so forth, we just think makes a lot of sense. And as the chief said, we're, we're constantly working together anyway. And, and one of the things that has really brought our departments together, and we are unique. I will say this. We are unique. Um, a lot of people say that. <laughs> but, um, we are unique in the sense that I go to, uh, I go to police chief meetings, and I know that uh, Mike goes to fire chief meetings, and there's constant bickering, and um, they don't get along. They fight with each other and so forth, and that's never been... Um, that's never been the case here in Scarborough. And we owe that to the people that have come before us because they have just instilled in everybody uh, as we, you know, to be a community and to be uh, one public safety uh, uh, entity and to work together. And that's just always the way it's been. What's that? That's what it is. That's what it is. It came right out of Scarborough High School. Um, so one of the things we wanted to point out, you saw the front entrance there, and, and um, when we were back, you saw the area that was uh, designed for network operations and so forth. One of the questions that we've been asked here is that, and this, is, this elevation shows the existing town hall, where we are right now, and then as you can see off to the left, that would be the front entrance of, of the uh, public safety building. One of the questions we've been asked is about the tower, because it doesn't, uh, it's probably not the most appealing thing. But one of the things that we tried to do throughout this building, and, and we dealt with this a lot as we went through the different, Mike mentioned there were six revisions, we went through this a lot. We're looking at functionality, efficiencies, um, and when you look at that tower, it, yes, it's not the most attractive thing, but at the same time, it's the highest spot on the property, and what's really important to us is that we be able to communicate with our firefighters and police officers out in the field. And so in order to do that, we really needed it to be on the highest spot, and then um, to have it close by to where our dispatch area is and where the network communicates, it all makes sense and it's for efficiency. So it might not be the best looking thing, um, but at the same time, we kind of feel like somebody comes to a public safety building, they probably should expect to see a, a radio tower too. So, um. Can you throw a cell phone tower in there? <laughs> What's that? Can you throw a cell phone tower in there or could. next to it? Oh. I wish we could. It's like the biggest dead spot in town. It's right there. <laughs> yes, it is. That might be possible. We, yeah. might, we might gain some revenue from that. Yep. <laughs> and the other thing with these designs is they, they've tried to do a good job in making it look like it's part of the community that's here already. So it mimics a lot of the design features of, of uh, Town Hall, as well as Bessie School across the street. It, it really has been 
um, designed so it looks like it fits rather than being something mm -hmm. you know, really off the wall. This is just another view as if you was heading north on Route 1, so if you're, you're really right across from uh, Bessie School now looking towards the north, that's what the, you would see. Mm -hmm. And then this one is if you're standing in Memorial Park looking back at the old station. Uh, from that direction, that shows you the apparatus bays on the basement level and town halls just peeking out of the, the left there behind it. So <laughs> that leads us that leads us to the money. So the construction cost uh, just over seventeen million dollars. That's for the building, uh, site, and road work, communications tower, and an escalation to uh, two thousand eighteen. And then soft cost uh, two million eight hundred. And again, we, uh, we worked really hard on this one. I think this is one that, that you can make uh, some, some progress with in terms of dollars. We, uh, we went through this and we looked at uh, some of the equipment that's in dispatch already, does not need to be, uh, originally the architect, architect had brand new stuff uh, built in and um, we feel that we can bring our relatively new consoles over from dispatch and there isn't, isn't a need for that new equipment. Um, Things like, uh, just a quick example, but down in the fitness room, originally it was designed to have mirrors all the way around the, uh, all the, way around the room, um, <laughs> and it was quite a sizable amount of money, and we said we really don't need to look at ourselves that much. We can <laughs> probably maybe one mirror will we'll do it. Um, so we were able to save money in places like that, and really throughout the building, and, and Mike showed you the, uh, the folks that were on that committee, and we really strived. Um, we had some of the people from the, from the tax group, and we really strive to try to make this a Chevrolet. We, and, you know, we're not looking for a Cadillac, we're looking for a Chevrolet. And we've tried to um, impress upon the architect all along the way that we're not looking for marble and, and all, anything fancy. We're looking for a healthy, functional, efficient building uh, that's gonna serve the needs for, of our community going into the future. So then we have a contingency of uh, one seven, and that uh, originally was quite a bit higher but um, they made the decision early on, we made the decision as a committee to do some additional borings and so forth that would not normally be done at this phase. Um, but we felt like it was important to have a better understanding of what there is for ledge out there and so forth, because we know there's some. And um, so we spent the money up front to, to have, uh, have uh, the borings done and so forth, so we'd have a better idea. And as a result of that, uh, we were able to reduce this contingency some because uh, and normally that contingency would be on the whole project, 10% uh, of the whole project, and as you can see, it's 10% of the uh, construction cost. So we were able to lower that some by getting a better understanding of what there is for ledge out there. So the bottom line is, is we're looking at 21.5 as the total project cost. And then, as I mentioned earlier on, we have a reserve account. I, I told you the story about buying the land next to the veterans' home. What I failed to tell you at that point was we sold that land. Uh, when, the, when we bought the land the first time, the administration of the Veterans Home was very happy to, to do that. They had some needs for expansion at the back of their facility. We swapped some land with them. We made some purchases. After this project stalled because of the recession that, that happened right after the report came out in 2008, about a year later, the, vet, the administration of the Veterans Home changed, and the new person that was in charge came down to, to see us and, and really was quite frank in that they didn't want us there uh, because they had looked at their plans and they saw uh, some much bigger opportunities for expansion of their own facility in that direction. So the town manager at the time was Ron Owens, and he negotiated a very favorable uh, sale. We sold the property that we had just bought year or so before uh, and made a significant profit on it. And we put that in a reserve account which we have used to purchase the three houses that are out here. We own those and have owned those for some time now. We purchased a house at North Scarborough adjacent to the station up there for future expansion. Same thing at Dunstan. So we bought five properties overall and there's still over $600,000 left in that reserve account that we plan to plow into this project to reduce the amount that we need to borrow. The other thing that the committee was charged with is what do we do with the existing facility? That's a question that comes up a lot from the public uh, and it's something that the council charged the committee with looking at. And they, the guidance was look at the municipal facilities plan, see if there's anything that's in the near future that could uh, be suitable for that location and give us a recommendation. 
the committee did. They went through the plan. There are some IT needs. There certainly has been a lot of talk about a community center. Uh, and the, the committee looked at that. We took a couple of different options for community centers and plopped it on our, our uh, uh, parcel there to see what would work. And, and there just really wasn't enough space there, along with the access issues, along with the lack of parking, to make any of those work. So at the end of the day, um, we had a commercial broker come in that brought some developers in and, and really gave us a good idea of what that property might be worth in the development world. Uh, and we were surprised to learn that there are some folks that really specialize in this type of thing. And as you can see, like the, the garage barbecue down at Pine Point. For some reason, people get a kick out of those old fire stations and the old garage type things. And th there's some ideas that, that really might work there. So the, the committee at the end of the day decided that the highest and best use of that facility was to sell it and turn it into a taxable property that would help bring taxes in every year instead of a, a non-taxable property that uh, was going to sit there for a period of time and certainly is going to take a lot of money to rehab or, or retrofit. So we took a conservative number of, of $1.4 million on top of the uh, reserve account that we've got that got our borrowing amount or not to exceed bond amount down to $19,500,000. So looking at that uh, 19.5, and, and uh, one of the things that gets asked too is what happens if we sell that for more than 1.4, and we do think that that's a fairly conservative number. Any monies that came in beyond that would just reduce that 19.5 and would be less that we would borrow in bond. Um, so we wanted to look at what does that mean to the average person or to the average homeowner. And so the annual cost when broken down for residential home uh, valued at 300000 which seems to be the standard that people use when they make these comparisons, um, ranges from $111 a year in year one to $54 in year 30. The, the amount goes down as the, uh, as the years progress. So the average of those 30 years is $80.43 a year over the 30-year bond, which equates to $1.55 per week. Now, if you look at that, by capita instead of uh, on, the, on home with a population of 20,000 folks, um, that range goes from $70 uh, in year one to $34 in year 30, or an average of $50 per week over the 30-year bond, and that equates to just under a dollar per week. And we're told that people don't uh, necessarily buy uh, newspapers every day, but if they <laughs> did, we've put a little comparison there as to what people would pay for a week for for newspapers. So the other question that we, we hear quite often and I know is of the concern of a number of folks is can we afford this as a community? So the, the way that we've tried to answer that is we worked with Larissa, a town, the assistant manager and, and the finance director, Ruth Porter, and um, came up with these bullets to help illustrate where the town is. Just like when you go for a home mortgage, you have to have certain credit parameters and, and ratios towns do when they go to bond and borrow money for capital projects. So these are some bond industry standards that, uh, that we wanted to go through. First one is the current debt as a percentage of our town valuation. <coughs> the industry standard is to keep that less than 10%. Ours is about 2.5% right now, certainly well within the range. One of the other things they track is the increase, the largest increase over the past 10 years. The industry standards to keep that less than 20 percent, ours is less than 1 percent at, at 0.7 percent. The largest increase over four years, once again, we're, we're less than 1 percent. The industry standard is less than 50. And then uh, one of the other measures they do is net debt per capita of personal income. Unfortunately, because this is generated by the census, we had to go back to 2010 to actually get the official personal income data from the census. But at that time, the bond industry standard was to keep it under 15%. We were just over 8% or almost 9%. So one of the questions we get asked is, what are the implications of waiting? And uh, we've tried to answer that in a number of different ways. First of all, we know that construction costs are increasing far faster than inflation. We know that interest rates are already rising and borrowing will be much more expensive as time goes on. Um, we know that the maintenance of our current facility has been postponed for years, necessitating spending resources on an obsolete building. Um, 
as Mike said in the beginning, you know, this whole thing started in around 2007, and since that time we've been given direction not to make any uh, major uh, renovations to the building, or, or, or and we've deferred maintenance all along. Um, and there's just no question that we're going to have some significant cost uh, as we move forward. We don't know how long, how much longer the boiler is going to last. Um, we lost the uh, the hot water heater this past year, and unfortunately, it uh, it sprayed water uh, all over some equipment that uh, radio very sensitive radio equipment that shouldn't even be stored in there, but it would, because we have no other place to put it. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't ruined, but it could, certainly could have been. Um, we've got carpets that need to be replaced that are a liability if people uh, should slip and fall. We've got uh, leaks in, in every uh, ceiling throughout the building. Uh, there's just a, a, a lot of things that if we were to uh, stay in that building for any length of time that are going to have to be dealt with. And this chart just really illustrates the, the actual cost. Mm -hmm. We started in 2008, which was, as I mentioned, when we did that last study and we're planning to move forward before the recession. At that time, the building was about 43,000 square feet at a cost of 13.8 million mm -hmm. or about a little over $300 a square foot. Just by waiting till today to, to try to do it, now because of the increased demands over the past 10 years, we're up to a 53,000 square foot building at 21.5 million or a little over four dollars a square foot. And then just two years from now, if the building doesn't grow and, and we're just looking at the cost of construction uh, that we see every day and, and know is going up, that cost per square foot is up to four hundred and fifty dollars. And the other key point of this is what interest rates are doing. In 2008, uh, just before the recession, we were paying just under five percent. We're in a very positive bond market right now. The, the estimate is three and a half for this project, um, but we know and we've already seen the Fed raising and, and the projection <coughs> to wait just two years is that we'll be looking at another half a point increase. Half a point doesn't sound like much, but over 30 years and that kind of money, it's, it's serious money. So we wanted to make sure um, a couple of things. We wanted to have some money uh, to build a small memorial should we be fortunate enough to have the building, uh, much like Gorham has, just a memorial for uh, firefighters and police officers and things that are no longer with us. And um, we also wanted to have some money that we could use for uh, advocacy for this, uh, for this building. And we didn't want to certainly be in a position to spend taxpayer money for that, so we have uh, uh, we have a gentleman who stepped forward and, and set up a nonprofit organization um, called the Friends of Scarborough Public Safety to raise money so that we can uh, uh, have some signs uh, made if we need to. Uh, we're taking out a uh, page in the back of the leader here in a week or so, uh, so we could pay for those kind of things without that coming from taxpayer dollars. And then, uh, w if we're fortunate enough to the, the vote passes and we build the building we would use uh, the remaining funds to put towards the memorial. So that concludes. I really appreciate your patience. Are there any questions that, that you folks have? Yes. Um, well, first, thank you so much for coming to our meeting because it's important because it's going to be on the campus that we see all the ins and outs. But, I mean, public safety, we're so um, instrumental in the Wentworth Building Project, helping us build a case for the safety and health concerns in that building and um, a big part of the planning for the building and, you know, thank you a million times for that. It was obviously needed. Your building has been <laughs> in need for way too long and so absolutely we support you and, and your endeavor and should this pass in November, and it should, um, I just was wondering when the project is slated to begin and when it would be ready to move into. Sure. That's a great question. We actually are meeting with the architect and, and uh, being cautiously optimistic <laughs> next week. And uh, the, this is really just a feasibility study. So we've, we've got a good solid foundation, but there's a formal design process, mm -hmm. there's bidding, we've got to get a construction manager on board. So the idea is that would take most of the winter and into the spring. We'd hope to break ground sometime in the summer or into the beginning of fall hope to get the foundation in before cold weather, which is always good. And then they're talking about an 18-month build mm -hmm. cycle, once mm -hmm. again. But that's all from the feasibility study right. phase, and it could change. But that's more or less where we're at. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Donna. Yeah. 
Jackie? No, I was just going to say that uh, several years ago, I served on the rebuilding committees for both the, the Black Point and the Eight Corner Station. And one of the things I contributed was the fact that I said they needed ladies' rooms. They seriously did not have ladies' rooms in those two facilities. Hmm. And they asked me if they needed to paint them pink, and I said, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got a lot, we've got a lot more ladies now. Than oh, I know you have. Mm -hmm. Both departments. That's a, that's a great point, though. In 1989, when we built the building, the locker room for the, for the uh, female employees right now has five lockers. And um, we've probably got 15 or so uh, mm -hmm. female employees now. So. Donna. And I was just going to um, commend you for the job well done. You and the greater committee with uh, Kevin Freeman heading that up. Um, you definitely did your homework on this one. And you've been doing it for a number of years, obviously, because the need's been really great. And I would recommend anyone out there who happens to be watching this program, if you're not satisfied by looking at the video, go in and have a look for yourself because the proof is in the pudding on this one. It is sitting right there for you to find out for yourself what's going on for sure. So I, I really, really hope that people will take advantage of that opportunity and get out there and vote. It's really important that this gets passed in our community. And I appreciate you mentioned people coming in. We are there 24-7 and, and we do have employees there all the time that are more than willing to to show people through the building so that they can see firsthand. Some of these pictures don't really do, mm -hmm. the, do justice exactly. to, uh, to what the inside of the building looks like. Mm -hmm. And I remember when you opened, when we opened that facility, you did have a meeting room. It wasn't for 100 people, but I think my recollection was it had four or five tables. Oh yeah, we still do. We fight over it daily. <laughs> 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 but to Donna's point too, the one thing that, if you don't mind, I'd like to advertise is we, we are and have been advertising an open house on the 14th. So as part of the conclusion of Fire Prevention Week, we're going to do a Fire Prevention <coughs> and Public Safety uh, open house from 10 to 2 on Saturday the 14th. There's going to be a ton of stuff there for the kids, a lot of educational stuff, but we also have brought in a bounce house to keep the kids occupied mm -hmm. so we can take the parents for a little tour. and do some outreach uh, that day too. So there's going to be a lot of different things going on. It's the, we've done these in the past and, and had some mixed results with attendance, but we've really planned a really comprehensive day with a lot of opportunities. So we encourage all the, the families to come out for a real fun family-oriented day on Saturday the 14th. I'm going to have to skip class to make it. <laughs> One question I had just looking at the projections do you, have you guys, uh, obviously I'm sure you have, but it looks like the projections have you almost doubling in size by, by 2041. Does this facility accommodate that amount of growth? It does. That was one of the first things that the space needs assessment process went through. So it looked at staffing. Your point's well taken, but a mm -hmm. lot of the patrol offices don't work in the don't station. Don't so need the space. at yeah. the end of the day, yes, those, those, that staffing has been accounted. We did look, uh, when we built the building here in 1989, um, every seat was filled the day that we opened. Mm -hmm. um, since that time, as you saw, there are a lot of different programs and things that we're doing, and, and we have a lot of different positions that we didn't have at the time. Um, we haven't, uh, we've, we've built minimal additional space in here. I think on the police side, we have, uh, we have one office that won't have somebody in it uh, when, we, when we move in. Um, but as the chief said, for, for the police department, most of the growth would be in patrol. And so what we have done is right-size the locker rooms and, right. and those kind of report writing rooms and those kind of things. We haven't got a lot of empty offices, but we have right-sized that. And we also have made sure uh, that the architect took into account future expansion <coughs> and uh, has built the, the, the building in such a way that the, uh, the structure is there. We're not going to build out, but, but the structure is there, the infrastructure is there to allow us to build out in certain areas it. should it be necessary moving forward. On each one of the levels, including the, the bay and the, the road access, so we yeah. plan for expansion in, in each one of the, the four levels of the building. Smart. 
Okay, well with that I'd like to offer the resolution um, in support of Scarborough's Public Safety Building. The Scarborough School Board advocates for safe and secure schools, and whereas the Scarborough School Board promotes a safe and healthy community in partnership with, the Scarborough's, with Scarborough's Public Safety, whereas the Scarborough School Board respects and values the work and ethics of the Scarborough Public Safety Team, whereas the Scarborough School Board appreciates the outstanding efforts and responsive actions of all of the public safety partners in an effort to continuously meet the changing needs of our community, whereas the Scarborough School Board pledges to work alongside our public safety team to enhance the quality of life in the town of Scarborough, <coughs> whereas the Scarborough School Board supports the collaboration and alliance that Scarborough Public Schools has with the school resource officers and their continued presence and association they have with our school community, whereas the Scarborough School Board recognizes the treacherous and seriousness of the work of our public safety team as they provide fire protection, advanced life support, emergency medical services, search and rescue, protection of life and property, preservation of peace, the protection of the individual rights, and reduction of crime for Scarborough residents daily. Be it resolved that these statements exemplify the importance of enhancing and supporting the Scarborough Public Safety Facility. Therefore, the Scarborough School Board is a strong advocate and supporter of Scarborough's public safety, and along with the Scarborough Public School staff, students, and all the Scarborough community will continue to work with and work beside our partners in Scarborough's public safety. The 5th of October, 2017. Thank you. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for I'd coming. I'd just like to add one thing. We, we probably skipped over a little bit on the, uh, uh, on the access road and so forth, but I just wanted to point out that there are additional parking spots there and so forth that are built into this to allow for folks that are using the park to have some additional spaces there. And we have uh, down at the end where it comes out and comes out directly across uh, Sawyer Road. Um, I just wanted to, because it's a question that people have, we're not uh, disturbing the archway. We're not disturbing any of the memorial benches or trees or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. We've been very careful to make sure that all those things have, have uh, been kept in place. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay. So um, next is 7.0. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Chair's report. Um, basically, I just want to let people know that fall sports are winding down. Clubs are gearing up, and I encourage all the students to get involved in something. Find something. There's plenty of clubs, plenty of activities available. Um, and now that you've got you know, a little bit of school under your belt, you get out there and join some things. And mostly I want to welcome our new student rep, <laughs> Dylan Hinton. Yay! Congratulations! <laughs> Nice to see you on this side of the table. You've been a fan for a while, but it's nice that you're, you're a part of it. Um, and with that, I will conclude my report, um, and we'll go right to the student report. Take it. Take it, boys. All right. So, just move this over. Um, so, yes, thank you for bringing up the election of our new school board representative. I just want to uh, state my appreciation uh, for um, the work ethic that Dylan has had, and I think that he will do a fantastic job as school board representative. Um, <clears throat> and so, in terms of uh, things going on in the high school, on Friday, uh, last Friday, uh, Scarborough had, a, uh, had the pep rally as part of Spirit Week. I wasn't able to attend because of a uh, um, college tour, However, from what I've heard, it was quite fun. The seniors won, and <laughs> <I'll do you. laughs> uh, just big surprise there. Uh, <laughs> but I can say that there was a lot of great effort uh, put into the event. Um, the boards for each of the classes were very beautifully direct, uh, decorated. Mm -hmm. uh, the sophomores even had a, like a copy of the Starry Night, which yeah, that was awesome. Which that is was Jillian Cody. Yeah, Jillian Cody gets props for that. It was awesome. I oh. saw that. Really <laughs> extraordinary work there, um, and and there were uh, some corny puns up there too. But whatever. <laughs> um, uh, and also. Uh, on Saturday, there was, of course, the homecoming dance, uh, from what I've heard, because I wasn't able to attend that one either. Um, it, it went quite well. Um, also, 
football team have their homecom uh, homecoming game. And the football team will also be having their mattress fundraiser on the 23rd. So if you need a mattress and you want to fund <laughs> the football team, gladly go over and uh, help support them. Um, so uh, NHS, uh, National Honor Society, has also um, uh, sent out applications for people who have been nominated. Um, and those and people who have had their nominations have filled out their applications still in that process of selecting people. Um, but hopefully that will be finished soon. Um, PSATs for sophomores and juniors will be happening soon. Uh, what is the exact date? Next, next week. Next Wednesday, yeah. Okay. Um, of course, the day that PSATs will be happening, there, there will also be financial awareness for seniors. Um, so <clears throat> also, go, uh, going back in time a little bit more, um, uh, on the topic of activities, once again, on uh, between September 5th and September 8th, uh, there was an activities fair. And I have to say that uh, that went really well. Clubs um, and uh, athletic teams and extracurriculars from all over the school uh, came set up booths to advertise for uh, what they're doing, got people interested. I've got to say that I actually joined a club as a result of that, um, learned about clubs that I hadn't otherwise known. So I'd have to say uh, it, it was quite successful. And I think that it's really good at you know urging students to get more involved in uh, activities outside of school. Um, and also picture day, yearbooks, all that stuff. If you want to have a discount on your yearbook, you want to sign up for it tonight like Friday is when it ends so right now if you want a yearbook and you want to save money on it get out your phone right get out your laptop whatever right. uh, otherwise the prices will definitely go up um, open house uh, mid, -September, uh, mid, mid September I believe at the high school they were on the 15th uh, those all went well. Uh, that's not just including the high school. That's also, uh, or not just the high school. That's uh, also the middle school, Wentworth, uh, and the K through 12 or K through 2 uh, schools as well. Uh, is there anything that you have to add? Uh, yeah, Brad. Um, just to speak on the club fair, I spent a good portion of my summer organizing that the activities fair, and out of that, we are creating a club network, which will be a monthly meeting among the leaders of the clubs so we can reorganize the activities page on the high school website along with getting a better list and description of each club. Um, I just wanted to thank the school board for giving me this opportunity to be on here. Um, during the elections, I was running unopposed, so <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't terribly worried, but <laughs> it's still. There could have been a dark horse. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am looking forward to being on here. I think that this role is going to reflect, I can use my experience from different positions I have at the high school as the GSA president along with the civil rights president. Um, and I think that this role will allow me to speak for the rights and ideas of the students, staff, clubs, groups, et cetera, of Scarborough. And I look forward to being on the board this year. Good, Great. thank you. Welcome. Thank you, welcome, Dylan. Okay, if that concludes the student report, that takes us to committee reports. Let's go, finance. Bang it out. I don't have a lot to say yeah. for my committee report. Good job, Lee. Really, yeah. Kate is here and going to do all the heavy lifting tonight. Okay. So I'll have a few um, motions to come. Okay. Donna? Also, uh, the Business and School Partnership continues to do the work that we've been doing all along and um, banging out some of the details of how some of the programs might be able to work, both on the business side as well as the school side. Um, on policy, we uh, have con continued to do our work to improve the policies that we have, get rid of the ones we don't need, 
and we should be meeting again at the next school board meeting at 6 o'clock that night. Kelly, if you can get that on. And uh, at that time, taking a look at the cell phone policy for the school system. Uh, this has been a hot topic across the nation in terms of how students are using their cell phones, and so we want to get on top of uh, what the best uh, options are for our policy to improve. Okay. Um, just before I forget, too, I also want to uh, remind people that we are going to repeat the community Thanksgiving this year at Wentworth on Thanksgiving Day. Um, all are welcome. We had uh, about 250 last year. I think we ended up serving about 250. We had great volunteers. It was a lot of fun. Um, free. Free. Yeah, it's for anyone. Anyone who just wants to spend the day with somebody, come and join us. And um, more details to come, but just want to let you know it's happening. So, you know, don't book your plane tickets because we'll feed you instead. Um, communication. <laughs> um, our next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, October 10th at 2 o'clock, and uh, we are working hard right now to get our newsletter out probably next week. Okay. Jackie? The neg negotiations is on hold. Um, as far as Maine School Board is concerned, I thought we would have an agenda item tonight or to talk about who will be the voting representative. At the conference? At the conference. Uh, right. Well, actually, what we've all, we've done on the, we've had an agenda item, but somebody yeah. has volunteered. Right, and I'm not sure who's going. I, Donna, yeah. you're going, are you going, Mary? I'm going. Yeah. We have so one more meeting before um, that conference. Yeah. Yeah. We do. Right. Yeah. So. It, I should be thinking about it. I'm going to be there, but I would rather not be the board's representative because I just think it would be nice if you would. Also, uh, I wanted to ask, did you all see the uh, notice from the DOE about uh, the proposal on diplomas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you cry? I said, mm -hmm. all There's this no work more and they've changed. I knew they were, I knew just knew something like this was going to happen. The good news is that they're listening to the yeah. public comments. So they Same received yes. lots of input. Um, and I know that the all of the various groups, the, the special ed directors in Maine, the superintendents groups in Maine, the curriculum director, everyone was submitting comments. Parents. So yeah. parents. So I think that the good news is, is that they're listening to us. Um, and we've said right from the get-go that we're not doing this because of the law. That cre the law does create a bit of a timeline that may or may not have been our choice in terms of the speed of implementation. Right. But we um, firmly believe that these transformations that we are making um, are what's best for our students. So we will continue to right. stay the path. Uh, I do want to announce uh, that the Kiwanis Club of Scarborough is holding a blood drive. Given all the tragedies that have been going on, uh, the, it, it will be on the 11th, which is a Wednesday, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Cabela's. So a blood drive, 11 to 5 at Cabela's on the 11th. And then October 12th, Right here in Chambers will be Candidates Night. Yep. So I think people should be aware of that. Do you know what time it is, Jackie? I have no idea. You, normally it starts around 6.30 with no, Sanitary no, it's, District. It's and then earlier than that. Is six, it going to be earlier? 6 o'clock. It's going to be 6? Six? 6 o'clock. Six yes. o'clock. You're so good. Well, I asked six the audience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> 6 p.m. and that starts with sanitary district and then goes yeah, to the goes board. Yeah, goes to the board. Right. Goes to the. It, it'll be a long one. Yeah. With all the candidates. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. So that takes us to 9.0 public comment on agenda items. If there are any members of the public who would like to speak on any agenda items, this is your chance. Seeing none, we'll close public comment and go right to new business. It looks long, but we can do it, team. We're going to get this done. 
10.1, meeting minutes of September 7th, 2017. Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions, comments, or changes? Okay, all in favor? All unanimous, great. 10.2, motion to approve the 2017-2020 SEA support professionals contract. Want to give us a little Move ditty? approval. Uh, I would just like to say that we settled this contract in three meetings. Uh, it, there was no contentiousness whatsoever. Uh, we gave a little on, on um, vacation and we got a little on compressing the, um, the salary schedule. Those are about the only two things that were really discussed. We lowered the time that people needed to be employed here uh, from 20 years to 15 at the end of the three years of the contract for a retirement stipend. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Got it. Okay. All in favor? Also unanimous. Thank you. Ten, um, we did 10.3 already. 10.4, motion to approve the resolution in support of public education. Move approval as printed. Second. Any questions or comments about this? So I um, took the liberty to begin to do some edits to this resolution. If you remember at our last meeting or two meetings ago, I had shared with you the um, I Love Public Education initiative from the AASA, which is the National Superintendents Association, and they were encouraging each group to, or um, each district to bring it to their local school boards to adapt, adopt, modify the their version of the resolution. So I have chosen to um, adapt it. We did have a policy meeting um, a few weeks ago, but we ran out of time to fully discuss this. So um, I leave it to the board if you want to adopt this resolution tonight or table it for further discussion, um, seeing as I, I just provided this to you this evening. I, I don't have a problem with it. There's not substantive changes. I still support public education, as I did <laughs> a few weeks ago, so I'm comfortable with it. Does anybody else have any concerns, questions, or comments? Not in favor of public education. I know. No. Um, actually, that happens in other places. It's terrifying <laughs> and it's real and it does happen. Mm -hmm. I'll spare you all the NPR story I heard about it, but Jody knows my fear. Anyone else? Oh, I just, I think it looks like, in looking at it, it looks like you had removed, I think Jackie had mentioned something about the charter. There was yes. something about mm -hmm. charter schools, and I think that was probably the only thing that, you mm -hmm. know, so that seemed. I also, based on the discussion of the last group, um, uh, edited the sentence about the accountability systems. Um, again, we do receive local, state, and federal funding, so <coughs> by law, under the Every Student Succeeds Act, we are required to have accountability systems, so I modified that language based on our discussion, um, but, but did feel that it was important to keep that in there. Mm -hmm. well. I move to support the Scarborough School Board's resolution in support of public education. Yep. Okay, so for a Ready for a vote? I'm not going to read it because it's really long, but we'll have it on the website. Absolutely. Um, basically, we love schools, public schools in particular. And now when you share it. stories of school, you can say hashtag love public education and we can trend with the nation in supporting public schools. Fantastic. <laughs> all right, all in favor of the resolution? Also unanimous. Uh, Oh, we, okay, so we need to go back and do the vote on that. Okay. We didn't, right, okay. All right, so going back to the public safety, do we have a move approval as read? Second. Okay, do we have any other comments about it or are we ready just to approve that one? All right, all in favor? Public safety building resolution done. Thank you, Carrie. Um, 10.5. FY17 year-end financial report. Hi guys. <laughs> You're really challenging me tonight because I didn't realize how much was going to be on your agenda. These are the nights when you really earn your stipend, that, that huge yeah. amount of money, except for these guys. Because I want to remind us all, we're going to make it. 
9.30 is our limit. We're going to make it. 9.30, we do have two motions that we need to get to, um, so I'm going to talk really fast. And um, I think I, I'll mention right now that what we'll do is we'll put this presentation up on the website so that people can walk through it. Um, a lot of the material that you're going to hear me speaking tonight is going to be on the documents that you're holding. I handed out two, uh, no, three things to you. I handed out a financial report, which is six pages starting with notes and comments. The notes and comments are the things that I'm going to be pointing out to you in person this evening, but this allows us to post the financial report later on so that other people can take a look at it and be sort of directed to the same topics that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, the second document that you have is one of my pretty colored sheets. It's got pink and green on it. Those are our action items for tonight. We have budget transfers that we need to approve. Uh, and there's a third single sheet, which is the actual school board action items that Jody's going to introduce when I get done here. Um, so again, I, I'm, I'm going to talk fast so we can get to 930 and still have a chance to vote on some things. Um, if you have questions, obviously I want you to ask me, but I also am thinking that perhaps you could jot things down and if we run out of time tonight, then we can address some of those things offline or, or we can bring them back to finance or whatever seems to be the right way to handle that. Um, and I will take 30 seconds to say, hey, Dylan, thank you for coming. And uh, this is like really brave of you. <laughs> so <coughs> Kelly, I just click, right? Oh, beautiful. All right. So the first thing that I like to do, um, thinking that I have acres of time to talk to you about these things is, is to remind us why we're talking about finance. And we're talking about finance because in the 2016-17 fiscal year, we actually did a lot of stuff. And that stuff cost money, but it's also really important to remind ourselves what it is that we're doing here. So these bullets are kind of the things that we focused on in education. Um, I'm not going to read the slides to you again. You know, we'll post them and, and I can send you copies of them. But let's talk about the fact that we're here discussing money because we've got important work to do. We've got important things that are going on. And these are some of the bullets that we, you've heard about all through um, our discussions with Leadership Council. The second slide I've got here is um, a little bit about efficiency. We've been hearing a lot from the Department of Education, from other communities, from the state of Maine about being efficient in our use of resources. And when I hear those things, I, I reflect on some of the work that we've already been doing. Um, the, the state is really focused right now in the Department of Ed on things like vocational schools and administrative costs and, and trying to find some efficiencies across school districts. Um, these bullets are some of the things where we're already sharing some resources um, either with other school districts, with the town of Scarborough, with the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, you're aware of a lot of these things, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little pointed out, say, hey, these are some of the things that we're already working on um, so that we're really making the best use of our resources. We're not wasting money, and wherever we can, we're trying to save money and uh, to work more efficiently. Um, one of the things I've spent a lot of time about, I'll take you down to the sixth bullet, fifth bullet, the centralized printing, Google sharing. Um, one of the things that's, that's coming up later on is a, a question of postage expense, which is something we're working on. But we've really spent a lot of time um, in our operations piece trying to get people not to print, trying to get people to print thoughtfully, trying to get people to share on Google. I mean, Google has changed our way of working amazingly. Um, and we've just updated our fleet of MFPs. Y'all voted on a, a lease purchase agreement not too long ago um, for new MFPs. Those are allowing us to do scan to email. Um, we're just trying really hard uh, to keep some of those operational costs down. Just one small example. Probably the most important bullet on this page is the long range facilities planning data and analysis. Julie talked about that quite a bit earlier. Um, really being thoughtful, again, about how it is that we apply our resources, what is it that we're um, doing with the funds that are given to us, and, you know, let's not throw good money after bad, like public safety was just talking about. Um, all of those things are things that we have our eyes on when we're talking about fiscal responsibility. 
Um, next slide, uh, again, another focus in 2016-17 was on commu communications. Um, we were lucky enough to have Julie join us in July of 2016. She brought some new eyes and, and new ideas into the district. Her entry plan uh, really allowed us to talk about um, the ways that we do business um, and to think about how we uh, relate to one another and, and how our operations work. And for me, particularly in the budget process, guiding somebody new through our budget process for the first time um, really shone a light on how we do things well, where we could do things better, um, and the communication piece as well. So when someone new comes in, you have to recognize that maybe the things you take for granted aren't obvious to others. And that's really important when we're dealing with the community as well. Okay, so the money piece, right? So let's jump into the financial statement. Now what you have in front of you, remember you have that one with the notes and comments on the front of it. And skipping the first two pages, which are the notes and comments, you go to the third page and there's where you hit the actual financial statement. Uh, the handout, um, actually, the piece that I'm looking at right here on the slide is a blown up version of what's on page four which is the trajectory from the end of June in 2016 to the end of June in 2017. So this is the fund balance stuff. This is the, you know, show me the money, get to the bottom line, tell me what I got left. We started with a large surplus in June of 2016. As you know, we've applied that to the budget in 2018. Um, and in the middle section there, you're looking at what we, uh, what we saved on appropriations, what we saved on spending, what we uh, did not gain in revenue, um, the year-end adjustment that we're going to talk about for school nutrition. What we actually accomplished at the end of FY17 was adding $107,000 to our fund balance. So the bottom line is that having used $2.1 million for this coming year, the year that we're in today, uh, we have about $221,000 of unassigned fund balance at the end of the year. Um, I'll mention here our favorite topic. This, I'm, I'm going to be so glad not to ever say the use of Wentworth Project <laughs> funds again. It's, it's my least favorite phrase. But um, the reason that we had a $2.6 million starting balance at the beginning of this school year or the 2016 fiscal year is that we gained that money through the use of Wentworth Project funds in 2016 and we also used it in 2017. So at the end of 2016, we had a much larger fund balance than usual. And as I just said, we've used that in 2018 uh, to balance some losses of other revenues. The transfer at the end of 2016, the amount actually impacts our revenue in 17, and we'll be talking about that down the road a little piece here. Um, now we're going to dive into the general fund expenditures. Um, on your financial statement, you want to look at the top of page three. That's the chunk that talks about appropriations, which is expenditures. Um, general fund expenditures, as you can see on the slide, came in under budget by $861,000. Uh, that's a pretty significant savings, um, and it came from two different types of um, of, of reasons. One on this slide is called fortunate outcomes, which is sort of a poetic way of saying things broke well for us. Um, salaries and benefits district-wide, we had personnel turnover and benefit changes in all departments, about $150,000 saved over what we expected to spend in the budget. Um, that includes teaching personnel, professional staff, as well as the continuing bus driver shortage. Um, which doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Um, the second bullet on here talks about energy and fuel savings. Um, we do have uh, the challenge, like any other business, of volatility in um, energy commodities and fuel costs. All you have to do is look at the gas pumps to see mm -hmm. how crazy things are. Mm -hmm. um, but we do work with um, Competitive Energy, which is a contracting company that helps us manage our contracts with the various energy providers. And um, we are also working on energy efficiency upgrades. So we netted about $100,000 savings over what we expected to spend in this year's budget in energy costs. The second type of savings that I point to is 
through strategic efforts. And what I mean by that is that we've actually taken some sort of um, considered and, um, and deliberate action to save money knowing that we needed to have some kind of a year-end fund balance. The special services tuitions costs, tuition costs, um, we talked about a little bit during the budget process. Um, we were able to um, save money on tuition over what we had budgeted by about $200,000, and we did that in two ways. One way, which you've heard about through the budget conversations, is that the Special Services Department was able to bring quite a few children back into our district mm -hmm. in the past two years um, and be able to provide services and programming for them in-house so that they wouldn't have to go out to special purpose private schools and they could be served right here in our community. So, I mean, that's most certainly a strategic effort. The other way that special services has saved some money is to leverage some of the funds that we get from the federal government through the IDEA or local entitlement program. And um, what they've done is some of the unexpected costs that have come up in tuition in this last year, they've actually charged off to grant funds that they've set aside for that purpose rather than using grant funds for other things. Um, so they were able to save us some money in 2017. The other two bullets are about curtailment, and curtailment uh, is not one of my favorite words either, but it's, uh, it's a way for our school leadership to say, you know, we really need to be very cautious, more so than we usually are. School leaders are always striving to come in under budget on their discretionary accounts by at least a small margin. We can't go over budget um, by law, so um, we're all sort of in the habit of pinching a penny now and again. But the curtailment that we've put into place at the end of uh, fiscal 17 was a little bit more strategic, a little bit more careful. It was basically by April, it was pretty much a spending freeze and it was saying, you know, we really are not doing anything else unless, unless it's critical. Unless there's already, you know, a classroom full of kids that needs that book, we're not going to get that book. And um, so on the instructional side, one of the places where we really cut back was um, unfortunately in professional development costs but also in purchases for the classroom that weren't absolutely essential, where someone might be wanting to try something out or test something for the future. We just deferred that. In operations, a uh, similar approach where we said, you know, we're going to take care of the things that are absolutely necessary. We're not going to do a lot of um, forward thinking or, um, or proactive improvements. We're simply just going to take care of business and make sure that everything stays safe and healthy. Um, but again, you know, not spend money that, that we have left in the, in the coffers right now. So those curtailment efforts and the savings overall actually played a critical role in keeping us in the black this year because uh, one of the next things we'll be talking about is the revenue picture. And uh, as it turned out, we actually needed that $861,000 to get to that $107,000 balance at the end of the year that I, I pointed out in the earlier slide. Um, if we make it to uh, 9.30, um, you guys are going to be able to vote on the budget transfers for individual accounts overspent by $10,000 or more. All of those overages can be offset by surplus in other budget lines and all within the same voter approved categories this year. Um, Should we take a pause and do yeah, an extension? Or we could just vote right now. Or well, vote I right now. Say, why don't we, can't I make a motion to just delay the so I just, I don't, I just looked at the policy, that's what I was just doing, and it doesn't explicitly say that we can or cannot, so okay. it says that will not after 9.30. After okay. But you can make a motion to extend. Make a motion. Okay. We have, I know, but it doesn't, it just doesn't, it say, doesn't it. say it. It says not to vote don't on even need that. action item after 9.30, if, even if you extend it. Yeah, so I think we just need to. All right, so I'll do our motions and then we'll come back. Just because I feel like this is an important, this is really important information, it is. and I hate to think that we're like rushing through this. Right. Okay. Not just me. It's so it's a pause. We're yeah. coming back to you. No, and, and Kate put a lot of time and effort yeah. into creating this presentation, <laughs> yeah. so I think it's right. really. I'm going to scooch now. forward a little bit, guys, so we can Let's talk about the transfers here. Um, sorry. I thought we were extending the time first. She's saying we keep the policy says the policy isn't doesn't, doesn't allow us can. to do that. We can do anything we want because by a vote of a majority of the board, quite frankly. All right. 
Do you think we can? Then let's do it. I was just looking at the policy that's referred We've to. We've done it before, so let's do it. So we're doing business here. Okay, All right. So I move that we extend um, the time limit to 10 p.m. Second. Any questions, comments? Okay. All in favor? <laughs> yeah, if you guys want to go home and do homework. Oh, you, it's a fr no, it's their Friday. Yeah. I'm making them stay. No. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have school tomorrow. So. Well, we can stay as long as we want. Yeah, you're here. <laughs> oh, my God. I All don't right. know what Dylan thinks about this. <laughs> when is it appropriate to ask a question about uh, what's been said already? Or do you prefer Kate? Want Kate questions at the end? Jot questions. Yeah, jot them. She said jot them down. I, yeah, I think if I sort of power through, it would probably make everybody comfortable, and then we can get to our vote. And um, obviously, I'll want to take questions at the end, Jackie. Um, so now we're into the, let's see. I threw myself off just a hair here, but okay. So we were right here, and we were talking about, hey, we got to vote. And now we have the opportunity to do that, so we're happy. Um, now I'm going to have you look at the pink and green thing, which is, bless me which is the account detail for the budget transfers that we need to have you guys approve tonight. Uh, most of the accounts are in categories you're used to seeing. Um, pretty much all but one of them is in salaries and benefits, and typically this is what you look at at, at year end. You're looking at turnover changes that have caused one account to go higher than another. Um, the last account on the chart is for district postage costs. And for a number of reasons, we had overages in all of our postage lines last year. <coughs> um, we had some heavy mailing of test scores that had to go out by mail and uh, new systems. Um, we're actually looking at that as a leadership team to make sure that we're not sending things by mail that really aren't in, uh, necessary or appropriate to do. Um, but a lot of that stuff is, is mandated. So um, that's something we're looking at, and it is one of the sort of oddball budget transfers that I have. Um, there's also some mid-year transfers, which you don't have to vote on. These are transfers that are done um, by various school leaders during the middle of the year. They're less than the $10,000, but they do cross over the budget categories. So I want to make sure that you had a summary of that. Um, I'll explain what they're for. And um, on the second page of the pink and green one, you've got a list of all the voter budget categories, a list of all the starting budget amounts and the ending budget amounts and the changes between those categories. And on the third page, you have a list of these items that I'm talking about right here that we took care of during the middle of the year. Um, those are just informational for you. They're not part of the vote. Um, and the, there, these bullets are pretty self-explanatory. We had some staffing changes in ESL. Um, the budgeted amount was for an ed tech. It actually turned out that it needed to be a teacher. That was something we didn't catch in the budget process, so we moved some funds. Shortage of bus drivers meant that we didn't have money in athletics that we needed for bus drivers enough to cover contracted transportation. So we moved some funding from the transportation department where we weren't paying for the bus drivers who won't come and work for us into athletics. Um, postage, again, was an issue, so we moved some money from supply lines in other areas. Um, and in health services, we had uh, coverage difficulties. And we were using, um, we were spending a fortune on subs and, and trying to make sure that we had coverage for all of our kiddos. We've actually shifted funding from other sub lines in 2017 and addressed that with some staffing shifts in 2018. Um, the, second page of your handout there is kind of, a, this, this is the same image that's on the handout, but this is for the viewers. It tells you what the budget categories were that the voters voted for, where we landed at year end, and the category change column there is important because there's a statute in a little tiny writing down at the bottom there that says that for what the voters told us they wanted us to spend, we're not allowed to go and move that money around willy-nilly. We, can, we can't take away more than 5% of any of those cost centers and give it to another cost center. So that last column is important. The auditors look at that. The DOE looks at that and says, well, did you take away more than 5% of any of those categories and give it to someone else? And the answer to that is no, we didn't. I mean, the highest shift was the whole transportation athletics thing. And um, even that is well below the 5% threshold. 
um, the biggest reduction of any category was transportation, and that's 3.1 percent. All right, so here's the big picture on appropriations. So again, appropriations is your expenditures, your budget, and what was actually expended and what your budget balance is. So this is the detail that's at on your uh, page three of your printed financial statement. Um, just again, for the viewers, it's pretty tiny, but we'll post this online so people can see the details. Um, and this is broken out by those voter categories. So now we get from expenditures into revenues. Um, Year-end general fund revenues were short of budgeted projections by $477,000. The largest shortfall was $268,994 in Wentworth project funds, again my favorite topic. A portion of the original amount that was budgeted as FY17 revenue was actually transferred early to the general fund at the end of 2016. And due to a clerical oversight, the 2017 revenue expectation was not adjusted down at that time. So while the total of the Wentworth project funds we used remained the same, the revenue received in 2017 was lower than what we expected. So I made a little slide here with a chart. And again, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can see this clearly, but we'll put this online as well. Um, the left-hand side of this chart tells you what the spending plan was that we developed, and I, it was with Bernstein Shore, who was um, counseling the town on what to do with the excess Wentworth funds at the end of the project and how they needed to be spent. We developed a plan that said we were going to use the Wentworth funds in two years, 16 and 17, and at the end of that, the funds were going to be gone. If you look at the left side, we had a plan to spend a million dollars in 16 and then a million six in 17. If you look at the right side of the chart, we actually spent a million three, almost a million four in 16, and a million three in 17. So because of the way that the funds were laid out in 16, they were, um, we didn't expect to have the funds available. So they were replacing already budgeted funds. That's how we got that huge fund balance that we saw in that first slide. In FY17, we'd already identified the available funds in time to budget it as revenue. So this year, it looks like a revenue shortfall. But the funds are basically there. They're done. They're used. Um, it's just basically an accounting change. But what it does do is it, it shows us with a revenue shortfall in 2017. Um, other areas where we had shortfalls in revenue for the past several years, the main DOE has been deducting main care seed funds from school GPA, which is a whole different workshop topic that we could spend the month on. This year's amount was almost $90,000, which included some retro adjustments from FY16. State agency client funding varies with the number of kids who are eligible in any given year. It's very uh, difficult to predict, and that came in short by about $47,000. And Medicaid reimbursement has also been a point of pain for us. Um, we've pretty much had to abandon Medicaid billing, and we talked about this a little bit in a couple of different meetings, because the state has really refused to guarantee that they're not going to reach out and bill parents in their private medical insurance for services that are provided in schools. And so there's two problems with that. One is that parents have to give informed consent for us to be able to bill Medicaid for services provided to their child while they're at school. Mm -hmm. And what parent is going to give consent to a billing that may impact their, their family's medical insurance? Mm -hmm. And then the second piece that's difficult is how do we reconcile that with be, being um, required to and, and uh, morally obligated to provide a free and appropriate public education to students if then what's really happening is that their parents are paying money through their, their family uh, medical insurance. Mm -hmm. So until these sort of ethical and pros process questions are answered by the state, Medicaid billing is just not going to be a thing that we can, we can really, in good conscience, uh, take advantage of. Again, that's a, that's a workshop all by itself. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the areas we've talked about quite a bit is the contribution of revenues for school programming from sources outside of state and federal and local tax funding. We had you know, a really nice presentation from the New England Realty Group. We've talked about Saco Biddeford. We've got a lot of stuff going on where we're doing creative funding. 
Um, that's our new favorite word. Um, we're getting rid of Wentworth Project Funds. We're bringing in creative funds. Um, so I just bulleted a few of the things, a few of the areas that we actually have to think about when we, we're talking about school funding um, that really don't fall into the category of, of normal school funding um, mechanisms. So you'll see a lot of these on the financial statement, on page five of the financial statement, state and local grants are on there, donations, the Scarborough Education Foundation, state grants for PEPG and proficiency-based education are on there. Um, they certainly don't cover the cost of the, the initiatives, but they give us a little bit of money to help do, do that work. Um, booster funding doesn't show up in the financial statements, um, although the new board policy is going to allow us to keep a little bit closer tabs on that because we'll be doing the banking for those folks and we'll be able to generate reports on a more timely basis, um, easy access to that data. Student fees are actually part of the general fund revenues. They're on page three in the revenue section. Um, and again, on page five, uh, one of the student fees that we collect is for the <coughs> laptop program, so that we're, we're taking maintenance fees in um, from each student for those one-to-one -one devices, and those are part of the long-range plan for replacement of those devices, so those are going to be really critical to us. Also in, uh, on page five in that same section, I've built a new fund this year. Um, Peter and I have sort of brainstormed uh, some ways to separate out the backpack program a little bit and some of the other grants and donations that they've been getting and segregate those funds from the regular operating piece of the school nutrition program, um, which makes reporting easier. It makes, you know, sort of multi-year projects more, um, uh, more possible and it also uh, is more appropriate for us to say, well, you know, this is really for the backpack program. It's really not for normal school lunch. Um, and then the last thing is business partners and, and parents, parents and community members are giving us so much um, through their time, their service, um, their resources, and their money uh, on a daily basis. They're keeping things humming in our schools. And these are some of the things that we're going to try to quantify a little bit more. We've talked about it quite a bit. Um, Julie and I have some pretty charts in mind and some colors and shapes and things that we're working on. but. I didn't want to just sort of say, oh yeah, it's all about the budget without mentioning these guys. Um, in the other funds, I've skipped ahead a little bit on the financial statement. Now we're on page four. Um, the beginning of the other funds section is adult education. Um, adult education is its own fund. It came in slightly over budget on expenditures this year due to investment in instructional materials for workforce programming. Um, we noticed a little timing issue there with some summer programming coming up where we were purchasing materials but we weren't getting the tuition in because it wasn't due yet because it was a summer program. So we're going to work on the timing at the end of the year. The fiscal year hits right before the summer starts. So um, that's a little different from our normal programming. Um, we had a revenue shortfall in tuition receipts. Most of that was offset by increased state subsidy because we have more subsidizable course offerings, which is cool. Um, program ends the year fund balance in the black, um, not quite as big as last year, but they're still doing fine on their own. School nutrition. The school nutrition program is at the page, top of page five on the financial report. You've heard probably more than you ever need to hear about the school nutrition program, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. Um, you can see my bullets there. Uh, we do have a new point of sale software program this year. Um, was installed last July, so we've got a year's worth of data that I'm going to be trying to pull some reports and share with the finance committee and um, see if we can garner any in interesting thoughts about the program from there. Um, we have created that new fund, as I said, to, to segregate the, the separate donations. We're excited about the revenue that, that we're going to be seeing from Sockel and Bitterford Savings. Um, Peter's out there drumming up grants and doing interesting things. So um, there's some pretty cool things going on. Um, obviously, we still have an issue at the end of the year. Um, so that's why it's one of your, your action items tonight. We have a revenue shortfall again. We had uh, what I would call overambitious projections on food sales. Um, when we built the budget for FY18, we said, you know what, we just haven't been getting the sales that we've been putting into our budget. We've, you know, we've basically been sort of hoping and keeping our fingers crossed because we knew we had to get to a zero bottom line on this fund. 
um, and obviously that hasn't been happening. So we, in 18, I'm happy to say that we've made some adjustments. We've adjusted down those, um, those projections for revenue on food sales, but we've also, you know, hallelujah, and Thomas said I could do a dance. I'm not sure I'm, I have any strength left, but um, in 18, we've also budgeted finally for the first time um, actual tax dollars to go to the school nutrition program so that at the end of the year, we're not gonna be talking about this you know, we need more money from the general fund surplus. Um, but this year we've got a deficit, $276,151. So that will be your other action item tonight. Capital projects is the last page of the financial statement. Um, and it's uh, gonna look pretty much the same as it usually does because most of our projects are um, multi-year big category stuff. We all, we're always gonna have buses. We're always gonna have some IT tech refreshes. We're always going to have roofing and building envelope and flooring and um, HVAC. Um, the one item that stands out a little bit on the financial statement for the capital projects is the security and access management, which ends the year in it with a pretty big budget balance. And that's actually the same as it was last year. We've spent a little bit down, um, but the reason that that exists is that several years ago, we put a great deal of money into that line, thinking that we would be putting in emergency generators at the K-2 schools. Obviously, right after that, we went into our long-range planning um, process, and the first thing that came up was, what are we doing with the K-2 schools? So the idea of investing $200,000 to put generators into schools that we didn't really know what their future was going to be um, didn't seem very sensible. So we, we took that project offline and that money's just basically sitting there until we figure out what's next with the, with the K-2s. Um, and obviously we still got some time to go with that as well because we're gonna wait for the state to tell us what they're gonna do. And um, there's no harm in having that budget approved money sit there and there's no reason to use it right now. Um, looking forward, we've got FY18, we actually finished the first quarter of FY18 while I wasn't looking. Um, I'm gonna be doing an upload of some reports to the DOE next week and we'll be talking with the finance committee at our next meeting about first quarter of 2018. The auditors are coming the first week of October, or it's the week of the, no, sorry, November 6th. Um, so they'll spend the week with us um, and as they, their usual timeline is they finish the report at the end of December and then we have some kind of a meeting in January where they do a report out for us. Mm -hmm. Joint Finance Committee has already had a meeting in September. We've talked about continuing to meet um, even though we're gonna have, obviously we'll have some kind of turnover when the election comes and I hope everybody sticks with us because it's just so much fun. Um, but we do wanna keep that continuity and that collaboration going because we really feel like the, the one town, one budget thing is just critical. We, we really need to be doing these plans together and having these conversations together. Um, we know we have some challenges ahead. Uh, we're, we've passed a budget, thank God, um, but it's $209,000 below level services and it's well below the original budget that was proposed by the school board, so that's a challenge. Um, FY19 presents some uh, pretty big obstacles in terms of loss of revenues and loss of fund balance, um, normal fixed cost increases, um, and the fact that our GPA isn't really likely to change significantly. Um, so, you know, we're, we're aware of these things we're, and we're thinking ahead. We're also thinking about some of the positives though. Um, we were really able to make some really neat reallocations in our FY18 budget, um, shift some resources, some staffing, and um, really target some of the needs that we have in the school district um, with existing resources, um, but just to focus on the changing needs of students and not to do things just because we've always done them that way. Um, another thing we're really excited about is the, the strategic allocation of actual budgeted support for school nutrition, which again, you know, big dance for that one. Um, I've looked at personnel turnover in a preliminary way where, you know, we've just finally, I think we've made our last hire. I think Allison actually might have still a couple of places that she's looking at. And bus drivers. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what are we, four down on bus drivers, I think? Oh, no, okay. 
Um, personal turnover looks like we're going to create a little bit of savings as we typically do. I mean, this past year I just said that we, we had about $150,000 breakage or difference budget to actual. This year it looks like it's somewhere in the $100,000 range. Um, the big deal is that we've already asked leader leadership team to put a curtailment in place right from the get-go. Um, we've asked them to identify some small areas of their discretionary spending that we're setting aside. Obviously we know, you know, this is September and October. We really don't know what's on the horizon in terms of student needs, in, in terms of, of changing conditions in the schools. Um, but we've all made the commitment that we're going to sort of put that money aside and try to maximize our fund balance again at year-end fiscal 18, um, which will allow us to use those resources going into 19. Um, we have, you know, this is all voluntary. Um, we have a plan that we hope isn't going to severely impact our programs. Um, it's certainly something that we're going to try to um, keep unemotional and, and, you know, not make a big deal out of it, but we're going to be super careful, um, more so than we typically are. Um, it's not an easy task to do these kinds of things when you have a budget that's already, you know, well below where we started and what we had hoped to be able to invest, but we do have some really positive things going on and, and we're sure that we're going to be able to, to keep those things moving. All right, guys, drum roll, please. Here are your action items. And I think Jody's going to read out the motions for us. Um, I don't know if you'd like me to entertain some questions. I know Jackie had a question first. Now, I just want to know, and not this evening, you said that we had curtailments, and I want to know if some of those curtailments were made up with by teacher purchases. Mm. The answer later on. It, um, it, yeah, I'm sure it's something where we could sort of no, survey the folks about. The superintendent will have to find out. Okay. We have 11 more uh, action items after yours, Kate, so I'm, I'm a little anxious here. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Go ahead, Jordan. Okay. Uh, first action item is move approval to authorize budget transfers for accounts overspent by more than $10,000. Um, again, that's this sheet mm -hmm. that we went over. Mm -hmm provided to us by Kate. Second. Any questions, comments? Okay, all in favor? Unanimous, thank you. And then move approval to transfer $276,151 from general fund year-end fund balance to cover the school nutrition fund deficit. Second. Any questions or comments on that one? Okay, all in favor? Thank you, and also unanimous. <coughs> Okay, we already did the donation. Okay, thank so you. thank you so much, Kate. Thank so that's you. a lot of work and not fun for you to compile for us, but maybe for you to compile it, but Okay. So appointments <laughs> So appointments I suggest we just take them all together as one on motion. Okay. So do we have a motion? Move approval as presented. Second. Okay. Any questions or comments? Do you want to just, I'll, I'll just give you the list of things that are in this slate. Mm. Special services, consulting teachers, Wentworth School lead teachers, high school lead teachers, middle school lead teachers, Eight Corners lead teachers, Blue Point lead teachers, Pleasant Hill School lead teachers, Scarborough Central Certification Committee, middle school fall coaches, high school spring coach, high school co-curricular appointments, and those are mostly stipended. Those are all stipended. Oh, okay. Are some are volunteer though, right? Some are volunteer. I just want to point that out that we do have some volunteers. Yeah. <coughs> Second. Okay. Any questions or comments about that? All in favor? Thank you. Also unanimous. Any questions about the budget presentation? Um, yeah, since we only have to do one more vote before the end of the night, if there are any other questions about the budget presentation. I have one process question. Uh, you said you were pulling out just the accounting is going to be different for the backpack program. Would people make donations differently? Would they need to write their checks differently? No, because they're already identified for the backpack program. Okay. They have been all along. They've okay. They've had a donation account under school nutrition. Okay. This is just the way it's for saying, oh, yeah, really, really, really separate. Right. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No? That's it. Then we're going to go right to 12.0. Um, a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 4056A for discussions concerning personnel issue not to return to public session. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Thank you.